This is Jocko Podcast number 463 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Also joining us once again tonight is John Spencer. John Spencer, who is on Podcast 462. We talked about his book, Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership, and Social Connections in Modern Warfare. He was active duty in the Army for 25 years. He went up through the ranks. Do you guys call it a Mustang? Yes. Okay. We did. So he was a Mustang like me from private to major. <laughs> Uh, served as a platoon leader and a company commander in Iraq, and right now he is the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute, West Point. Also serves as the chair of urban warfare studies with the Madison Policy Forum and a member of the International Working Group on Subterranean Warfare. And he's written a bunch of books. We've covered one of them. He's written a bunch of articles. I've read some of them. He's contributed to a bunch of different books. And I guess the reason we stopped last time is because we were about to start getting into what you started doing when you retired from the Army. But I think one of the things that led to you what you did when you retired was teaching at West Point. Was that, a, was that impactful? So you're still in the Army and you ended up teaching at West Point. Yep. Talk to me about that. So actually my ex, or the, the young EOD, Lieutenant, had gotten a job to teach psychology at West Point and I needed to keep the family together. So I applied for a position in the Department of Military Instructions teaching tactics. But it was also an interesting time. I had just come out of the Pentagon actually working for the four-star general of the, the U.S. Army General Edward Nero. Where he had created, and, and I hate to admit this, something off of what the Navy had created. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, they called it the SSG, the Strategic Studies Group, and the CNO had one for like 20 years. He closed it. But the, the general at the time wanted one, so he put together this band of like 20 senior officers, junior officers, and civilians to think outside the box for him, the things that he wasn't watching. Uh, for a year, I studied mega cities, hmm. which was really the introduction of my academic study of urban areas, so the growth of cities around the world, urbanization, everything. And um, how many mega cities are there? Uh, there's over 35 at this moment. There were okay. predictions. So those are cities over 10 million. But it was that wasn't as important as the fact that you know, just from 1960, where we only had around 63 cities over a million, now there's over 500. So the rapid urbanization and population growth. But also it meant that more war was going to happen in urban areas. The year study found that the U.S. military wasn't prepared for operating in mega cities, and they had some recommendations. But I, like most military people, had to go on and do my next job. But I, that year was very formidable in my ability to think unconstrained by like what we were talking about in the last podcast about way military. So I, I actually was studying how the U.S. military is designed for um, certain planning scenarios. Like we'll fight counterinsurgency when we need to, but the military is designed to fight certain battles against certain enemies in certain locations. They're called defensive planning scenarios. So I took that out of that. But I went to West Point. You got to get back to your job. And I was teaching, you know, ambushes and raids and military departments. But the superintendent of West Point, who's a three-star general, said he wanted a relook at the the United States Military Academy's military program. Because it's a college, you know, that has a robust academic program, but it also has military, right? Um, so I, I was a part of, because I had come out of the Pentagon, I got a point in charge of this external review. We brought in General McMaster, General Abizade, a bunch of people to do and look at was West Point being the best, you know, not just in academics, but in military programs. And one of the solutions or one of the products of that review was to create a research center called the Modern War Institute. Cause what we found looking, you know, you want your military academies and you want, of course you want your military to be prepared for modern wars, but we found that historians study war from like 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Or 200 years ago, or right. 2,000 yeah. years ago. Right, yeah. but you know, for a historian to publish on war, it takes them a long time, mm-hmm. just by the, I, I make fun of historians a lot. I, journalists embed in, you know, like the Sebastian Youngers mm-hmm. and all those that, that report on what's going on now, but the military had actually not had, from an academic lens, people studying modern wars that much that's we created the modern wars to staffed it i was um the deputy director of it and this is when you were still active duty still active duty major um i also started teaching strategy so i went from teaching mm-hmm. platoon tactics to teaching strategy so like introduction to strategic studies so teaching cadets about clausewitz 
Sun Tzu, Jomini, Boyd, Warren, all these. So it it was really B. H. Liddell Hart. Yep, Hart. Okay. Yep, Thankfully. all of it. Yeah, no, we get we we cover you. Um, could we have a defense and strategic planning or strategic studies um, academic major there at West Point? So I was teaching it, which was a little challenge. I hadn't learned any of that, so I had to learn it and then teach it. But it gave me, you know, some of the stuff I incorporated in the books and not others, but also a language of connecting strategy, war, the history of how to study war, because uh, uh, some people don't even know, like even Clausewitz books is a guide to how to study war mm-hmm. and how to study the width, depth, and context of it, which really starts to come into play when I start studying urban battles is the context of it. Teaching, but it's time to go military says you know either you move to this job away from your family or you can you know take the exit and i took the exit mm-hmm. but the modern war institute was up and running and i actually had written one article uh, a part of the modern war institute on the u.s military's use of concrete in iraq it's actually like the most effective weapon on the modern battlefield is concrete t barriers let's go that's right um, and i found out that the world did not know that the u.s military put up concrete in Iraq. Mm-hmm. That's how we reduced the IEDs. That's how we created the safe neighborhoods. We fought a whole battle called the Battle of Solder City where we put a mm-hmm. wall around the enemy. Um, it went viral, like National Geographic picked it up. Like It was insane that the world didn't know that that was a big part of our actual how we fought the war in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Whether it was Automedia, the Great Wall of Automedia. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, there was a market for urban research, but also because I had done that work on megacities, I knew that there's not a single office in the U.S. military that studies urban warfare. There's not a single school outside of like some, you know, inner and clear rooms mm-hmm. schools. Um, so the, the 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 gap in the body of knowledge for military studies was there. I wrote that article and responded, and then I started writing more articles. What year was that? That was 2017. Okay. My friend uh, Seth Stone, he was a, a troop commander that supported the effort to build the wall in Sauter City. And so he got home and he w- was going to brief like, like someone at the Pentagon, probably the probably the CNO or some, some, something along these lines, right? And so he came to my house and he, had his, he was preparing his slides and stuff and it was crappy, you know, but that's why he was over there because he knew it was crappy. And he's like, dude, I, you gotta help me. Like, I gotta give this brief and everyone's gonna be there, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, so I watched him do it like two times and I said no and I gave him this opener. And I, I gave him the opener, it was like five sentences of explaining what Solder City, you know, Solder City had been uh, a stronghold for the Mahdi militia for since 2003. It had this many casualties a day, it had this many rockets fired from it and we needed to stop this. So. We utilized an ancient, an ancient military strategy. We built a wall, and that was the opening of his thing, and it was freaking legit. <laughs> I actually, so I write case studies now, um, which I, I find fascinating, because a lot of, there's a lot of urban legends about urban warfare, like what we think happened, mm-hmm. whether it's even our own experiences, first battle of Fallujah, mm-hmm. second battle of Fallujah, Ramadi, haven't finished that case study, but we just finished a Solder City case study, which was interesting, because I was there. Mm-hmm. But then they have to use this, um, Framework because case study uses the same framework to, mm-hmm. to analyze like the strategic environment, the operational down to the tactical, and how we actually we actually the wall wasn't the plan mm-hmm. at all. The wall there's actually the company commander saying like, well, if I connect this wall, to this wall, they can't get to their rocket firing point. <laughs> or some it, badass company commander was yeah. like, hey, hold on a second, yeah, let's just finish building this. And thing. then you had like a division commander going. Yeah, yeah, do that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and then it cut the it cut the enemy off from the the money supply because the market was right outside the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're about to release that case study. This is also that concrete interesting that concrete article the modern war shoot also came out 2016 17. There's a there's a big battle happening right. Mm-hmm. There's the the 2016 battle of Mosul, the largest urban battle since World War II. And all of a sudden, I get a call from some downrange going. We'd like to talk to you about your concrete article. I'm like, why do you want to talk to me about my concrete article? Because uh, we left a lot of concrete in Iraq. We left all those T walls. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the, the Iraqis, if you stayed there long enough, would just move them out of the way or everything. Well, what did ISIS do with all that military grade fortifications? It used them mm-hmm. and built very massive fortification lines made of 
our tea barriers our tea bars which are really hard to do anything about because it's still reinforced you know steel rebar running through those and you can drop a a jade animal on some of them and they'll still be there uh so they it was really and interesting from you know academia to be called like man we, we got some questions about what your ideas about concrete are but 2018 it was time to hang up the hat and the modern wars two said we we're also doing something big part of um, doing the research was something we call contemporary battlefield assessments. We had this photo at West Point of cadets going to the battlefields of World War II, like mm. weeks after the war ended. They got on a ship in New Jersey and, yeah. and went there, and they were, they were being walked around the battlefield by veterans who had fought there. So awesome. Yeah, it was. We had that photo. It was a little part of standing at the Modern Wars, too, is that West Point used to do this. Yeah. I think we, we, we do an event called Battlefield, and we take people to. Gettysburg do, yeah. um, and I think we have pictures of them well we definitely have pictures of all kinds of West Pointers walking the battlefield at, yeah, at Gettysburg we do it every year uh, which is which is awesome but actually it's funny that you know I was pointing out the fire that we had at my gym yeah. which is right here um, and the firefighters because it was a real fire they really they got to fight the fire which you don't normally get to fight a fire the way they fought this fire the people had to go inside people had to put the hose down they had to rip open the roof and so they they walk their cadets through there now, and their probies. They walk them through and show them this is how this is what the guys and like the guys that did it go there and brief. Yep. So yeah, that's a very powerful thing. And I guess you guys at West Point were saying, wait a second, they used to take these guys right there, right after the battle. What are we doing? Yeah, we don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like we we do Gettysburg every year, and I can I can talk to you about every stand. Um, so we built into building this research center that that was one of the core functions because in the summers, West Point cadets go all around the world. They go to Africa, they go, they go all around the world, either language, culture, they embed with like the three letter organizations. It's really a mm -hmm. robust summer program, but nobody goes out and studies war. Mm -hmm. So we built this program called the Contemporary Battlefield Assessments. First place we took them was Bosnia to study like the siege of Sarajevo. Um, I actually, Took one of the last things I did in 2018 before retiring was take cadets to Mumbai, India, to study the 2008 Mumbai attacks, where ten terrorists take down a mega city mm -hmm. in one of the most impressively planned terrorist attacks that I've ever seen. But to walk the ground of every site that the the terrorists attacked and how they did it, how they planned it, everything, and then we went up to the north towards the Pakistani border because you know the, there are two week studies. But really after that, and that was amazing too to learn about that if you haven't studied that attack, uh, insane what they were able to do with a bunch of privates basically with um, the, the the terrorist had earphone, uh, basically satellite in their ears so they were being commanded from outside the country hmm. to attack and do certain things against these. They hit five locations simultaneously and just brought down a mega city, overloaded its systems, everything. From an urban warfare perspective, it was fascinating. But I also learned like, you can't replace walking the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, right about then is when I'm retiring, and then the because of the uniqueness of, there's like 27 research centers at West Point that also have the ability to hire external researchers. And I got offered, like, do you want to keep doing this? Like, yeah, that's a dream job. So at 2018, I started this academic urban warfare project, which I would focus only on urban warfare, study it, write about it. I started the podcast, that's now many years, um, to include interviewing experts in like smart cities and you know policing, like police chiefs and SWAT team leaders and everything, because you know, there's two aspects in my job of there's understanding urban warfare and like military operations, and urban training, but there's also understanding cities, and it's a giant gap in in the world, let alone militaries. Even the combatant commanders. I was at a conference where more inspiration of my job. A combatant commander said, "Look, I had this AOR." And I, I didn't have anybody in the entire combat command that could tell me about one of the cities because they do country teams. Mm -hmm. They can't tell you about like Dachau or, or Mumbai. When I was in Mumbai, like, okay, who's your Mumbai expert? Like, what do you mean Mumbai? We don't have a Mumbai expert. We have, we have country teams. Yeah, uh, that's crazy when you think about how unique cities are, even cities inside their own country, like just the methodology, that the ways the cities are laid out, what they're constructed with, how what the transportation's like, what the infrastructure's like. Like cities are so different. Even inside of America, cities are so totally different. Now you go into overseas, yeah, that's going to be radically different. 
And we did, I actually was doing this as well, taking cadets, because it's close to New York City, right? Which, the United States only has two mega cities. New York City, um, but the influence, and there's a, there's a concept of like mayors of the world. Like there's some cities and nations that are more powerful than the nation itself. Mm -hmm. It has more economic, you know, like all, it, it, the city is the nation. Mm -hmm. But we have this nation state country mindset which applies to even international relations, law of war, like, like, like a whole bunch of things. But we, um, I teach a course here in California where we actually take um, it's the urban operations planners course for divisions and brigades on how to fight large scale combat operations. It's been a part of the development. So I, I also do that in the California State Guard, but we'll fly them over Los Angeles. I mean, you couldn't ask for two different cities, the New York City yeah. and Los Angeles. Both are mega cities, but the complete terrain, you know, strategic importance, uh, everything, all the variables that we teach are vastly different. So, so you, you can't, urban warfare at that scale, especially that big scale, it's really hard when so many cities are so different. Like even the power structures, mm -hmm. like Mumbai has a, Mumbai has a slum built on trash that is a million people in a one mile area. Yeah. It's uh, if you've ever seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire. I have not seen it. Yeah, but it it I went in there and like like you would never want, even want to let alone do a military operation mm -hmm. in there. So I started doing that in 2018. I started writing, 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 um, and I'm publishing articles about you know, everything from drones and warfare to um, the deeper I understood urban warfare, I also understood like everything from even the battle drill. Like, where does this stuff come from? Like, where is our thinking going back in the past? Now, writing case studies about Stalingrad, Aachen, Ortona. Like, um, there are similarities in military approaches, but there's you know uniqueness. The difference between first battle of Fallujah, second battle of Fallujah, and just becoming more and more aware and learning every year. But then there's a war that starts. Well, actually, yeah, there's a war that starts. The 2022nd War of Nagorno-Karabakh. And you know, if, if your listeners don't know that, there's a place between, or it used to be a place between Azerbaijan and Armenia mm -hmm. called Nagorno-Karabakh. It was a really big war and everybody was watching because, you know, military not in war, they're watching other wars. And as I'm like this external now war researcher, I'm watching the media about it, it's like the drone war. Like drones are the future. Like this whole war is about drones, and actually that that war ended in a battle of a city, a single city. The the entire war, decisive battle over one city called Shusha. But because I was in this new role as a civilian, we thought, oh, maybe this could be a contemporary battlefield. Says maybe we could take cadets there once. So we started reaching out to the two country teams of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and saying, well, can we go in there? Like it had been like six months since the war ended. And they're like, no, you can't go in there. Nobody's allowed in there. I got invited. I won't tell you by who. So I took my blue passport because I'm a civilian. Mm -hmm. And I went to Azerbaijan. And I went into Nagorno-Karabakh. And went all the way to where that battle ended. To this place called Susha, which is, you would love it. I mean, they basically inserted two battalions of commandos. They combined their basically version of Navy SEALs and Rangers, combined them, inserted them over a long terrain. Um, the city was the decisive, they knew it was the objective and they scaled like a 400 foot cliff to infiltrate into the city and take it down with almost that, without a fight. Hmm. But I went there to study like, okay, look, everybody's talking about the drone warfare, but this city, this war ended when that city fell. Urban, you know, cities are the economic engines. A lot of times, they are the they are the objective. Like the take out the political apparatus, Baghdad, right? Mm -hmm. The drive to Baghdad, the punch to the middle, drive a tank around, psychologically yeah. defeat your enemy. Yeah, Berlin, Paris, yeah, yeah these that's right. These uh, things are important. But that started my, and I didn't even realize. Like, well, I got in a lot of trouble. Just you know. Of, why is John, you know, what is this American guy doing in that place that they're really not supposed to be? Um, wrote the study of, of, the, of the case study, which was, was doing great. Uh, we used to have a practice, like we the world, of going to other people's wars to learn about them. Like if you think about our civil war, we had the Germans here, the, you know, the British here, the French here, just observing, like, mm -hmm. like the both the changing in characters and the weapons, but yeah. just 
uh, we've we as Americans we had people like in Japanese China war other places and then in Vietnam you know observers became advisors advisors became boots on the ground but it, so through, maybe we shy a little bit away from that for a reason <laughs> there are many reasons now politically as yeah, I've learned because yeah. I want to tell you about more that I've learned that there's many reasons why we yeah. we don't do that but the fact is that we don't have people in war zones learning about the modern wars mm -hmm. and that came at a cost at West Point because you know, yeah. you know I'm preparing you for war but what about this war that's going on right now yeah and just for anybody that like no matter what industry you're in imagine let's say you didn't know anything about construction and then you went and spent a month on a construction site you that that's going to be irreplaceable compared to someone that sat in a classroom and learned about it or let's say you want to learn about manufacturing and you sat in a classroom for a month versus you went into a factory and saw how everything was run so the amount of things that you're going to learn when you get embedded and immersed in an environment is going to be exponentially better than what you learn sitting in a classroom so to your point even even you know whatever 150 years after the battle of gettysburg there's no doubt that when you go there and you walk the ground you learn more than you did when you sat in a classroom or when you read a book so now when you get there and there's an active war going on and you can talk to people and you can get the debriefs and you can watch with your own eyes and see it with your own expect uh, perspective which by the way is a nice detached perspective because you're not in it you're watching it and you can you the ability to learn is just phenomenal yep it's it's unmeasurable and it's it's crazy when i tell people like we don't do this like we mean we don't do this the same thing when i tell you that there's i mean the the u.s military is millions of people and there's not one person whose only job is to study urban warfare there's not one office yeah, that's crazy yeah um but we also we used to have a group called the asymmetric warfare group in the I u.s um, and they would go into operational areas as operational advisors to U.S. forces in certain areas, but they weren't going into other people's wars mm -hmm. that we weren't in to learn, just to learn. Right. Uh, so I did that with Nagorno Karabakh, which was great. Like, and, and it was, and people really valued like, how did that city fall? How did that? It led to the end of the war. Of course, the war two years later it, it, it started back up. Mm -hmm. But then the, so then Russia invades Ukraine in February of 2022. At this point, I had been studying urban warfare, everything from tactics, like, and, and to include myself having been in the military for 20 years, not, like not knowing where Battle Drill 6, like inner and clear room came mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. and how it merged, like from 1973, from like Israeli Special Forces Yamam responding to the failed Munich raid into our special units, into our special forces into the main where I was in Ranger Regiment yep. hearing about it but and then we exploded across the whole US military when we were struggling in Iraq and like everybody knows how to enter and clear a room now even mm -hmm. though that tactic doesn't really apply to urban warfare <laughs> I don't know if you know that echo so we learned to like do SWAT team tactics and, mm -hmm. and, and stack outside of doors you know yep. uh, hostage rescue hostage rescue but in in battle in wars where the enemy knows you're there that goes away really quickly Matter of fact, in the second battle of Fallujah, they were doing that and they quickly stopped it. They, they know you're there. Mm -hmm. it, that, that tactic is on surprise and violence of action. If you don't have surprise, it's not going to work that well. And the Israelis learned that hard in like 2002 when they started going through walls instead of then going through the doors and the windows. But I had been, so the war starts in 2022 and I had, had been studying urban war for a little while. I also studied it from both the operational perspective of uh, how to defeat how to win wars like take the capital city you know or whatever it is depending on what the objective of the war is so i saw russia heading for the capital of kiev of ukraine and this is on february 26 i started using my back then it was called twitter i created a seven tweet a seven thread tweet on what i john spencer as just a regular guy would do if my city was being attacked it was like you know you block the roads, park dump trucks, like literally from things. I had actually written an article in December of 2021, 20, I think. Yeah, we're saying, looking at all the battles of history, like the Battle of Seoul, Battle of Manila, um, what the defenders did well. So I actually wrote an article, like tactics that have worked in defending cities, snipers, barriers, like all these things. 
And I incorporated that you know, a couple months later. I'm like, hey, if, I, if that was this is this is what I would do. Mm-hmm. And I put out this seven um, tweet thread. It went viral. This is the, the the wars that we live in now. It went viral. Like 20 million people saw this tweet thread, and then people started asking for more. So I started doing like little wire diagrams of do this, not that. Mm-hmm. You know, use. Con, you know, use a bus, not sandbags. And I started putting together these PDFs, and that became, or these images on on Twitter, that became a PDF. And then Ukrainians were printing that out and distributing it, but the the images became a manual that was became what was called the mini manual for the Urban Defender, and they printed hundreds of thousands of copies because when the Russians invaded not just Kiev, but they actually attacked seven cities at once. The guidance from the Ukrainian government was resist. And they were, but that was literally the guidance. Mm -hmm. A couple guys were making Molotov cocktails and they made hundreds of thousands of those. And then they made these little, um, these little, I don't know if you've seen these, uh, like porcupine steel girder things. Mm -hmm. And they started putting those out everywhere. But that was the limit of the guidance. My manual within a week, um, the Ukrainian government took it and translated in Ukrainian and put it up on the website for resistors. And it was seen from literally from Lviv to Mariupol as a way civilians could help mm-hmm. resist the Russian invasion. Yeah, and it's a it's very thorough. Goes from everything from like the placement of you know, well, what you prefer to reinforce a building with, all the way down to like medical advice about, you know, putting on tourniquets the whole nine yards. So it's a really comprehensive, kind of like quick freaking urban combat defense for dummies type yep. thing no offense but it like that's what it is it's that basic hey this is what you need to do but it's stuff that actually echo you and i were talking about this earlier today like some things that they seem real obvious once you've been told them but when you haven't been told them you would never think of them so that's what i think that manual's uh, really good for it's got the fundamental principles in there for defense in an urban environment and clearly if you've just been attacked you're going to need those yeah and i kept updating it so like the version five that i stopped that like like this is becoming more than a guide to civilians this is becoming like a i actually helped rewrite the ranger handbook while i was a ranger instructor we talked about last so i knew also this ranger handbook if you don't know so what their students are required but our infantry carry is like a an awesome mm-hmm. manual but you know, it has a lot of stuff that nobody reads in it <laughs> And, and you really read it when you're in ranger school because you really need it, like how to, how to do an ambush, like it's in there, like, and, and you're allowed to have this book with you. So the, I, I had understood that under stress, people need simple instructions. So this is like, you know, go read a doctrinal manual. If you ever read a U.S. military doctrine, it reads like stereo instructions, like it sucks. <laughs> um, so like this is, a, I'm an old infantryman, lots of pictures, simple guidance. But then the manual kept growing, like people wanted to know how to purify water because like cities were cut off from water, like Mariupol. And then I had to get to with like survivalist, like the survivor man. And actually I was like, I don't want to say anything here that's um, wrong. Mm-hmm. Like how to purify water with chlorine, boil, you know, like all this. Yeah. Then it kept growing. And then you had units like, well, how do you do an ambush? Like, well, I know how to, I stopped doing it because it became more than that. But, uh, and that's great. And it helped one. I'm very proud that it helped a lot of people. But then it started. You stopped writing when they said, how do you run the staff side of right. the PowerPoint? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, counter drone, like, like all this stuff. Um, I left it be. But then it started being translated by other countries. So I get requests like, you know, and I put it out there for free, of course, like just so, as a PDF on my website where it still is. But then I started getting questions from like Myanmar. Like, can we translate, translate this? Like, Why? Uh, or I, during, it was actually during the women life freedom movement in the, in Iran as well. Like, can we translate this into Persian? Mm-hmm. Like, sure, go ahead. But why? Uh, then the, like the Polish um, education system. Can we translate this into Polish for our education system? Like, sure. Why? Because this ideal, I actually didn't. I hadn't studied this, but this ideal of total defense, right? The ideal. So we have. There's an ideal called total resistance. Um, but total defense is, you know, not uh, an insurgency like the person's already in your country, but like everybody's going to defend not letting the enemy in is very ancient. There's actually some from World War Two that I actually started tapping into, like um, the British had one, the Swiss have one that like under attack, our nation is going to defend ourselves. But with all of that, you know, the access to information, you know, the simple instructions of stuff like that for civilians 
got lost. So now I have now it's in 17 different languages and has been seen like in crazy places around the world, uh, because the simple instructions that are common to you and I, like nobody knows, even if they have this idea that of course all our you know Red Dawn. Uh, like yeah, but you need to know more than just like Red Dawn. <laughs> like you need to know, some of my book is even like what not to do. Like yeah. don't stand in the open. Yeah. Don't stand on a rooftop. Like that's the worst place you could be in a modern battlefield. Uh, so I was really surprised by it. Really happy about it. That that went out and everything. But I'm also you know I'm a I get paid to do research. So it's because of Nagana Karabakh, then I'm like and then me and my um, my partner who I do a lot of stuff with. Like can we go into Ukraine right now? Of course, the answer is no, you're not allowed, as in like if you're associated with the military or anything. Back then, this is, I actually was commenting on, you know, writing the manual as, so that happened in February 2022. Russia was defeated in April of 2022. And by defeated, I mean they did not achieve their strategic mm-hmm. goals of overthrowing the nation and erasing Ukraine as a, from existence. And they actually withdrew all their forces from Kyiv. I understood that that was was that the was that the stated Russian goal? Yes, was to turn Ukraine into Russia, all of it. Yeah, it was to denazify Ukraine. It was you know he so a lot of people try to do revisionist history and go back to it. Mm-hmm. It was a uh, NATO was expanding. Like I don't. Want, it, it's a long conversation mm-hmm. of w- things that have been said in the past that people then attribute to. Like no, this dude assembled two hundred thousand Russian forces around Ukraine, and then made a statement that the opening moments and said, we are entering Ukraine to denazify it from its government and to overthrow the government and to put basically to create Belarus 2.0. Mm-hmm. Putin wanted to put a, you know, within this breakup of the Soviet union, he has, and he talks about all the time, like his revisionist history of Peter the great and everything that Ukraine isn't a country according to him. And that's in his statements. He said, like he has said, like Ukraine isn't, a, it isn't a language. It isn't a people. It's Russian. His opening presidential comments on the opening of the war said, I'm doing this to denazify and free the Russian people. So he's, he literally doesn't believe that Ukrainians should exist. So he, his objective and what he did to do it. So you could say, okay, words don't matter. But, like, but okay. that, was the, that was the scheme of maneuver that he set up. That's right. He, and he made a lot of mistakes, and I've written about this. Um, so if his goal was to overthrow the government, pretty simple classic war goal, right? Take the capital city, overthrow the government, replace a friendly government, much like Iraq, Afghanistan, right? Uh, he launched, the decisive operation was Kiev, and he had to take the capital city, but he also launched against Mariupol, Sumy, Kharkiv. He actually attacked against seven different fronts, seven different cities, because he wanted them for different reasons. He, he didn't wait the main objective. He sent, um, and I've written about this, so the, the, in order to achieve the strategic goal, you had to take Kiev didn't have to conquer it. You just had to raise the Russian flag over the center of the city and, and say that it's yours, much like we did in Baghdad. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you cognitively defeat your enemy. He's lost the will to fight. They think it's useless. He thought he would do a Baghdad attack on Ukraine and, and use overwhelming surprise and speed and force to do it. Um, that happened in February, you know, and he, he actually tried to take an airfield. They tried to do a joint forcible entry, much like when I was a ranger, we would try. I mean, he, he tried to seize an airfield, hostile inside the capital city. He launched two mounted patrol, mounted formations of over 20,000 soldiers, one down out of Belarus and one out of Russia to attack the city and to take the city. Um, he ran into a lot of variables that I had been studying. He ran into urban terrain. Uh, he ran into people resisting that he didn't think would be resisting he he had you know he didn't listen to the special forces principle that one is none so he tried to take one airfield didn't have a backup so the plan started falling apart my manual was a a sideshow of it although they my manual was actually implemented in kiev as in they started parking dump trucks in the streets and things like that just trying to slow them down because in in this war the strategic objective was to rapidly take your objectives and rapidly take the city. So if you could slow them down, this is where you know, there's, there's an idea about does, you know, the, 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 according to Clausewitz, that defense is the strongest form of warfare, but not you, politically, but, but uh, tactically. Like, it's, you know, if you're in a defense, it's a lot easier if some, you know, than somebody than you're attacking a defense. But in war, the the objective could just be time. 
So in this case, Russia thought that they would take Ukraine quickly. And their military hadn't been tested at this scale in a long time. So as I, I was, I started, also I started, I hit the kind of the news commenting position. Once I did that tweet thread, once I, you know, like, there's an urban warfare guy, mm -hmm. I started talking about Kiev, and then I started getting requests to be on CNN and things like that about, okay, what's the goal here? How do they do it? And there, as you've listened to my podcast recently, there's lots of ways you can take a city. Mm -hmm. You don't have to encircle it and no. methodically take it down. You can infiltrate it like I had just seen. You can second battle of Fallujah, punch to the middle, make them fight you. Mm -hmm. You can, there, there's so many ways to take a city. I, I was analyzing it. Well, that's, this is the way they clearly, they're trying to do it. Uh, and they actually had like four courses of action that were close. So to give Russia some credit, I guess, they had put years of work into taking it down from inside the city, like with saboteurs, um, eliminating the government through. But you said they had plans for that? Yep. They had gone through like course of action planning yep. and picked the, the final one was speed, surprise, violence of action, get in there and overwhelm? No, they actually implemented all three at once. Oh, okay, so they did all three of these yep. things. So they had Spetsnaz and FSB forces inside the city who had like bought, um, rented apartment complexes next to the government building who had, were identifying targets to be attacked. Uh, they had put some work into the intelligence operation, which they had had success in. I, I wrote this for the war in Iraq, the Battle of Hostomel, which what breaks you through. Like the the first course of action Russia wanted was to take it down from within, which is of course the the best way to do it. So they wanted to eliminate, use the sleeper cells, and they had a lot of them. They activated the sleeper cells to take the the city down from within and take the government building, you know, either kill or capture Zelensky, and they implemented that. Mm -hmm. There's some reasons why it didn't work. Uh, to include, um, again, if you, I've had to learn all this as well, but after the 2014 Maidan revolution in Ukraine, Ukraine, you know, this is when the United States started doing some defense partnership, but we also, other people were also helping them. So they reinvented their army. They reinvented their police. So you, you know, this is, again, you think about urban warfare, you, we think about military on military, but most cities have tens of thousands of armed police. people, police. Mm -hmm. So their police um, started doing signals intelligence raids on supercells days before the invasion who were being activated. And so they did immense amount of works and that story hasn't been written that the, and I, I had, you know, this is me going back in there and, and recreating the battle of key, but the Ukrainian police had a huge part on taking that course of action away from the Russians. The, uh, the next course of action was the Joint Forcible Entry where they were going to take a bunch of airfields. But there's five airfields in just Kiev alone, massive ones. Mm -hmm. So the police and the military went out and started parking fire trucks on all the airfields and doing moving things um, so that when the Russians attacked, they were bombing empty parking lots because they had moved things. Although the, the president had ordered the military not to be out in defensive positions, which could potentially have saved them because if, had they been out and the you know the shock and all that Russia launched with the cruise missiles and everything, a lot of stuff wouldn't have got would have got blown up. So the joint forcible entry, which is an amazing story of they they've successfully penetrated uh, Ukrainian airspace, landed over three hundred special forces on one airfield about ten miles from the capital, less than ten miles. It um, twenty helicopters successfully inserted into this airfield in the capital city, and it looked like history that it was going to work, uh, except that they ran into just, just regular Ukrainians that were uh, attacking them and they actually took down a couple of helicopters. So the Russians had a thousand paratroopers on cargo planes in the air headed towards that airfield they just sieged successfully. Mm -hmm. Um, but because of Ukrainian Air Force. So the special operations guys were going to seize the airfield, set it up for a, a landing, yep. an airborne landing, yep. and then these thousand paratroopers were going to jump in, and now we have a foothold, and we're moving forward. They were going to air land. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an air lodgment, so a joint forcible entry, you seize the airfield, bring in the heavy cargo air, mm -hmm. and land it. Oh, so they weren't even going to parachute, and they were going to land, gonna and we're going to get started. Yep. And they were just, all they had to do was punch to the middle of the city. They had uh, sleeper cells that, like, guided in the way, like everything. But some Ukrainians, and there's, it's a really amazing story where like a private, like a finance guy uses like an old air defense system, takes down one helicopter, one of their alligators, K-52s, which are like our Apaches, like they're like tanks in the sky. 
and this is the the again studying modern war i found it really fascinating that that picture of that russian helicopter down did more to embolden the people of ukraine than anything else mm -hmm. because they thought they could fight back like we can fight back mm -hmm. and they took one helicopter like dude it's one helicopter out of like 20 mm -hmm. and they still inserted like 300 of their best special forces and they took the airfield and everything but they took that one down and and they started hitting other helicopters so they turn off the aircraft so now you have in this battle of kiev opening moments you have 300 of your best navy seals mm -hmm. on the ground in enemy territory holding the air but now but they're cut off and they're alone so literally the they're cnn i don't know if you saw this but cnn this is a modern war as well it's literally on the ground within minutes trying to interview russian special forces like what are you doing here and it's like an american cnn guy who went out to the airfield is trying to interview them which actually happened to me in northern iraq when i jumped into iraq the next morning they're cnn and fox <laughs> uh so he's literally trying to interview a russian guy going what are you doing here go away um but then they have the president say we know they're here and they and they launched everybody they had no matter who it was at that airfield and did a counterattack. i actually talked to the special forces major who had four hours to get there and it, it was like shooting fish in the gallery like it was just 300 dudes on an open airfield with no nothing more than what they carried on their backs because the airfield dropped them and left mm -hmm. uh, and then they started raining artillery down so they they eliminate these 300 and then they cratered the airfield uh, with some very big artillery they have, like 200 millimeter. Within hours, though, you have 20,000 Russians coming from through Chernobyl, which I found out where Chernobyl was, and, and I didn't even want to. I got really close to it as I'm, I went into Ukraine. Um, you had 20,000 making their way to that airfield. So the, Rus the Ukrainians killed those 300 basically mm -hmm. pull off the airfield because they know there's a massive force and they don't. There's only one brigade if I, in in all of Kiev. They, they thought the Russians were going to attack east, which they did. They didn't think, I don't know if they didn't think Russia had the, the cojones to take the capital. But there's only one army brigade, so this is mostly like civilians mm -hmm. and police and everybody fighting. And then the, the vehicles got stuck coming down out of Chernobyl. And then they have a fight for another like three weeks where all these mounted forces are trying to make their way into the city. It's a massive city. I mean, Kiev is you know, a city of three million people, it's a it's an ancient city actually the biggest encirclement in military history happened there in 1941 soviets versus the germans millions of people against millions of people the terrain got in their way ukrainians started doing things like they blew a dam um in the within hours of the invasion uh which has history that i didn't, that I didn't know but they they blew a whole dam which took away an entire axis of advance for the the russian forces that were trying to make their way into kiev they blew 300 bridges in 24 hours they didn't tell me how they that nobody will admit to because i think some of it they sua sponte and just blew all the bridges mm -hmm. so nobody actually will say like well, who blew, blew all the bridges like you don't know but they blew all the bridges which meant that the tanks you know tanks have to get to somewhere there's only something bridges right you think like um a bridge too far and things mm -hmm. like that like bridges come really important in big wars mm -hmm. so the ukrainians drop all the bridges they flooded this whole, they blew a dam, flooded a whole region. They went Red Dawn. Uh, I, I talked to grandfathers who, which I think this is what Red Dawn got wrong was the veterans. You know, mm. Ukraine's a, a conscript Soviet, you know, used to be a conscript Soviet satellite. So most of the adult men have served in the Soviet military. Right. So, I, so I have some fascinating stories of like grandpa with an RPG on top of, a, of his house mm -hmm. taking out Russians. Um, and there were a couple of winning moments in the opening hours of that where you, and literally like grandpa who went out to the airfield and got some stuff is given to his other grandpa friend. Well, Red Dawn forgot the veterans. So you have a lot of veteran communities and what they call like territorial defenders. And in April, this goes on for a few weeks and there's a couple moments. Um, in April, the Russians, literally Putin comes on like, oh, we didn't want to take all of Ukraine. He literally... Mm -hmm changes its entire strategic objectives and pulls and within 24 hours though so you had 40,000 russians around kiev at this point trying to penetrate and never were able to get to the government city and then overnight they're gone 24 hours they they you gotta give them credit they know how to run mm -hmm. so they they executed a textbook withdrawal mm -hmm. under fire 
and I actually followed their path all the way up to as close to Chernobyl as I wanted to get, uh, which was still too close. That was April. Now, because I, I had had this experience of going into wars to study it, I, this was the biggest, most decisive urban battle, as in it achieved the strategic goals for both sides. So either one side failed, one side was successful in saving Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Had Kiev fallen, we would probably not be talking about the Ukraine war right now mm -hmm. because the Russian would be, be over. So I wanted to get in there and study it. So I, I, took, I took a flight to Poland, walked across the border, went to Kiev and started interviewing the commanders who had defended the city. Because I think I still think it's one of the most decisive battles in modern history, because it achieved the strategic goal. Of course, the war, war the war continued because Putin himself said, "Well, that wasn't my goal. My strategic goals are these four districts in eastern Ukraine mm -hmm. that he wants." So he literally, within 24 hours, withdrew them all back into Belarus or Russia, and then redeployed them a couple months later mm -hmm. into eastern Ukraine. But he was defeated on for you know in April of 2022. But I, I went in to recreate the Battle of Kiev. So this, again, was the progression of my research of going into war zones while they're still going on. Um, I went back to Ukraine four times until, really until October 7th, trying to recreate the, like doing all the firsthand interviews with all the commanders and civilians and others that were at the pivotal moment. So I've fascinating you know i'm not a historian but trying to write applied history as how do you recreate who writes what happened in a battle and how do you do that has been really fascinating these are just case studies you can do it through historical knowledge but if you're doing it through firsthand knowledge we had to figure out what were the key moments in the battle of kiev like the the airfield hostomel but there's another one another battle of, like where the russians actually had forded the river after all the bridges were blown and it was like one company of Ukrainian collection of people that kept the Russians from actually penetrating into the city. So I went, I went back four times recreating and getting all the interviews with the, the, the generals to the soldiers at those moments to recreate what happened at that battle. I was also doing interviews with the, the Battle of Mariupol, if you don't know that story, where you know, 3,000 or less, it's like, it's like their Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. 3,000 soldiers hold off 20,000 Russians for over 80 days using the steel factory and underground. Uh, most of them sent, you know, were captured eventually, they, uh, and, but some of them were released. So I was doing interviews of recreating that battle, which is uh, from an urban warfare history, uh, very significant on what, from a operational perspective, how they held down those 20,000 Russians so they couldn't, like redeploy to the capital or redeploy to this other city, how important that urban battle was to the overall war as well. What? Let's start with Kiev. Was there anything that surprised you about Kiev from an urban warfare, like lesson learned where you hadn't really thought of that or maybe some new technology or new tactics that you saw? A lot, yeah. So one, so there's so many elements. One is just the history of the, of the, of the land. You know, learning that this was, you know, Kiev outdates Russia, right? Kiev and Rus, the city is like a fortress city. It was built there along the river for a certain reason. And all the battles that have happened for the city, really looking at even in 1941, the biggest encirclement, where does the battle focus on? It focuses on the east, the western side of the city uh, along that river that they actually blew the dam for and increased the river. Matter of fact, the Ukrainians who defended Kiev in 2022 fell in World War II trenches at times and we were back into the same trenches fighting at almost the same locations. So I learned a lot about the city. But there's also an interesting technology that the Ukrainians deployed that I had no idea about until I got there called Delta. So the Ukrainians had like their version of like the, um, DARPA or something like that. Um, they had created this computer system that integrated sensors everything from drone cameras to bank cameras to everything. They had invented it before the war. So in the Battle of Kiev, like, I didn't understand how just 3,000, that's how many military people were there, just 3,000, mm -hmm. not even a brigade. How were they always in the right place at the right time? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that it's because of Delta. So the Ukrainians, although I could watch, first war I've ever known of, I could watch live YouTube from Kiev during the battle, and I was. 
and and we see we all saw the videos of like highway cameras catching russians all this stuff but i didn't know that the ukrainians had this system called delta um, which was integrating all these sensors so they knew exactly where the russians were and and basically had an eye in the sky they actually ordered during the battle they ordered a hundred thousand dollar cameras I don't know if this is like Amazon War or whatever, uh, and got them into Kiev during the battle. This is between February and April of 2022, um, and then put them up on the high rises, so so they could they knew where the Russians were at all times. They only had one battalion of artillery, so there's a bunch of examples of. There's even an example that I tell where Grandma, in my I tell this story because it's really an example of a, a surprise. Out on the outskirts of Ukraine, there was a grandma who woke up and saw a Russian convoy sitting outside her house. So grandma picks up her phone and calls, calls it in. And I'm like, well, called it to who? Uh, the Ukrainians took uh, uh, basically like this government app called DIA that they had, which was like carried your passport, your driver's license, everything. And with, again, this is all under attack, transformed it to report enemy. So grandma takes out her camera or her phone, hits that button to report enemy. It goes to uh, an Intel fusion cell of civilians that they had set up. And then Dia, you know, the, the Delta system is able to validate that information. And then they send a TB2 drone over to it. So this, this computer system called Delta gave them an all-seeing eye that allowed them to use a very small force, but also the defensive properties of you're blocking everything, blowing all the bridges, blowing the dams, buying yourself time because the Russians only had like certain five days of supplies as well. And the logistical, you know, the 40 mile convoy going back into Belarus and mm -hmm. attack, it was being attacked. Um, so that aspect of the Delta system was very surprising. And, and I had actually, in my urban warfare studies heard of, like I had a, a thing about smart cities on my podcast you know, about the idea that you could tap into uh, all the cameras and all that stuff. Like this was in real time. Was happening. And they had a an artillery app as well. So they could integrate this all CNI, which they had no shortage of people wanting to help. Right. So they had like, I, that's what my question, like, well, how do you fuse this? Like, so they set up all these fusion centers and all the, they cut the city up into pies and put people out there. If you're a drone operator, they told you, you're going to give us your feet or we're going to, EW make it so you can't fly it. They did all this with like in a week and they had this all seeing eye up. So like the Russians in perspective had little chance of surprise, right? Surprise is still everything in war. If I can, they created this all seeing eye. Then they like that battle of that. I told you in Moshun where they had that breakthrough where the yeah. Russians pontoon, it was only, they knew they needed to get there. If not there, it was all going to be lost. Um, one of the early reports coming in was about the a lot of the senior officers in the Russian military getting killed, and it you know for me I deducted that okay why are there senior military leaders up on the front lines because there's some massive amount of micromanagement going on, and you know some centralized command certainly causing problems. Is that is that what you found as well when you debriefed? Absolutely. Um, so there's, you know, that really plays out a little bit later when they start using signals intelligence on, there's a reason why the Russians also relied on the cell phone network for their communication. They had just switched out their combo equipment. There's a lot of friends of mine that are like the Russian military experts. This is, but that's absolutely there. The Russians don't have a non-commissioned officer corps, right? So it's very officer driven, which is, we all know is a weakness. It's their system. Um, they also had done a reorganization of their battalion tactical groups to where they had less infantry from an urban war perspective, that really played out as well. Like you can have a convoy, but if you don't have the infantry to protect the convoy, you know, whether it's armor or whatever, then they found out really quickly that the changes they had made was war puts you to the test. Uh, it put their logistics to the test and like the, all the rot that was they, there. They ran into that problem in Chechnya too. They did. They which did. Which is interesting. Which, which is from a historian, not a, I'm not a historian, but from a researcher, like we have lessons that we learned and just relearn mm -hmm. and relearn. So same, same, but yeah, they're officers. And then, you know, after the battle of Kiev, Ukraine starts becoming very effective at targeting off senior officers and senior commands, uh, with the limited capabilities like drones and things like that, that play out. But it, yeah, it's a definitely a weakness in the Russian system, but, um, Russia also, especially within the urban, like I'm the urban warfare guy. So like I'm studying like Kiev, 
Mariupol, Bakhmut, they have a, a um, they have a human wave tactic to where they'll just send human waves at the defender to discover where he's at and then use artillery to flatten wherever they are. And they're still doing that today mm-hmm. on the battlefield. So that's another aspect of their weaknesses that started to play out and what they didn't have in Kiev that they adjusted and had in other places, like when they had the Battle of Bakhmut. How quickly did it become apparent the level of brutality that was going to be happening on like the front line scenarios here? Because I mean, I've seen, you know, like everybody else, I've seen the videos, the pictures, the reports of just savagery uh, happening how how quickly did that get initiated? Was it a result of frustration over time? Was it uh, something that came immediately, or did it show up as things progressed or digressed? I should say. Yeah, there's a bunch of events in the beginning that really, of course, um, I would say even in the Battle of Mariupol, where the they the you. Ukrainians who couldn't get out of the city were trapped in the city and, and there's an event where they're in a theater in Mariupol it's 600 women and children and they wrote the the letters children in Russian on the outside in giant letters outside the theater and the Russians dropped like multiple hundreds of pounds bombs on it and killed them all it was one of the first signs of they're not going to follow the rules mm-hmm. and then of course at the when the Russians pulled out in April of 2022 the massacre of Bucha is discovered where they just massacred hundreds of civilians, over a hundred civilians where they tied their hands behind the back, shot them in the back of the head. Um, some video cameras of that. It became really early on uh, recognizable that there was a lot of dehumanization that the Russians had in, in themselves about who the Ukrainian people were and what rules they were, or weren't going to follow in war. That savagery was, seen immediately in Kiev because that was my research but it's all throughout but some of the systematic aspects of it too like the fact that which is problematic because now we're going to we'll talk about it later I'm sure with Israel but um, Russia starts stealing the children of the areas that they conquer and sending them back into Russia so Ukrainian babies or like thousands of them they're taking back into Russia and giving them to Russian parents uh, there's a there's actually an ICC warrant for Putin and his the female that's helping him do this, not an application for a warrant, an actual warrant that was issued in 2022, because it was validated that he was doing this. So the the savagery is there 100. percent But it's also hard for people to understand the scale of this war. Like and again going there, like how long it um, unless I walk some of that ground, even within a city, let alone the entire front line getting people to understand the geography and the scale of this. I mean, the Ukrainian military went from like a hundred thousand to a million within a year. And that's going to cause a lot of problems on the battlefield and in the, in the country when you try to build a military under war. Uh, So there's lots of parts about the geography and the scale of this, that it was just foreign to most observers of war in general. So speaking of the scale of this, one of the things that's been debated a lot is the number of casualties on both sides. What are you, what are you thinking? What does it look like? Yeah, it's been interesting how it's, um, I understand. So war is a contest of will. And this is why, again, even in the Battle of Kiev, it was about time. It wasn't about killing on both sides. Um, it was about the ability to get supplies in there. So I understand the information operation is part of this where Ukraine, like other countries, like Sun Tzu's maxims on the strategies to defeat your enemy are still present today. Number one, defeat, you know, defeat your enemy without even fighting, defeat his strategy. Number two, defeat his allies. So one of the reasons that Ukraine hides its casualty numbers is because of what it would say to the rest of the world on how's it going basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the third one is defeat the enemy's military and interestingly for the urban warfare guy the fourth one is don't attack besieged cities basically do it at at the last last cause those maxims still apply so in ukraine's casualty numbers i've seen reports i haven't and and i've been there um and i know that especially as the war continued into some of these very attritional battles like bakhmut and others where they're just trying to hold the line that tens of thousands are dying um 
I try to believe, you know, this goes to what we will see later on, who do you believe, right? So the Ukrainians aren't putting it out, but like the British and the United States are putting out what Russia's are. Uh, I do believe it's a factor of like five to one, of five, because you, Russia doesn't care about their numbers and they're cremating them or they're not coming home, um, that it's, you know, last estimates are like 400,000 plus Russian deaths. But uh, to be honest, I don't have the both sides of the number. It's a lot, of course. But I don't, I also understand why they, because now you have people saying, well, we just want this to stop. Too many people have lost their lives in this battle, which is almost like the Chamberlain and the, you know, and the McCar- you know, the Churchill argument, like when does survival become uh, questionable? Like, like that was the option the Ukrainians got asked the question, which was unique to me traveling into war zones just to feel that. And I, 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 I never felt, felt that in my own deployments is going into a country that's under attack of like, ex, you know, an existential attack and a country can either mobilize their and, and resist that or what they thought the, the Russians thought the Ukrainians would welcome the Russians and they didn't, but, that was a very unique feeling that I had when I went into Ukraine in April, or it was actually May, um, is that unified aspect of we don't want, we want to survive, we don't want to be Russian. Um, I, we can talk about in Israel as well. We have people now arguing like that, that the numbers, that this quantitative number means whether they should continue to, to fight to be free. And then like, okay, what's the solutions here in, in war, understanding the history of wars where reason isn't always the number one, it's human. If it was just numbers, and I call this like the abacus fallacy, like, well, they have more troops, they have more artillery, they have more industrial base, like it's futile to resist. So what are you saying? Give up? Which is what, as you know, Churchill was faced with, like, it doesn't make any sense to resist Adolf Hitler. Like, yeah, it, freedom, had, it makes a lot of sense. And I felt that in all of the Ukrainian population when I visited. There's, of course, there's strategies into, to this. And maintaining 50-plus countries as your allies is absolute, is Ukraine's, one of its primary strategies to win the wars if you maintain your allies. So that number is problematic for them. But, of course, it's in the you know tens and hundreds of thousands. You know, one, one thing that I thought about as soon as this thing started was, you know, uh, war is a test of wills. And I believe that when your country gets invaded and you're defending your homeland, your will is going to be stronger than someone that's trying to, you know, take your property and, you know, move into your homeland. It's, you know, this is why... Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, like, hey, and this where I thought you were actually going was like, you know, you're going, you're looking at the war and you're going to leave. At some point, you're going to leave. And worst case scenario, they win. Cool. I'll go back home. I'll go back to Colorado and live my life. The people in Ukraine don't have that option. If they lose, they're going to be subjugated to this imposing force. And therefore, they're much more willing to make sacrifice because their will is going to be stronger. Now, that being said, there are definitely cases throughout history where you people get conquered. And at a certain point, they say, oh, you know what? I was going to fight. And, you know, you never know. This could have happened to Churchill. Churchill was not going to back down. But how many people, you know, how many cities could have been bombed? How many Brits could have been killed before Churchill said, you know what? We're going to make a deal or we're going to cease to exist or his attitude might have been, well, we would rather cease to exist than succumb to this uh, tyrannical Adolf Hitler. Uh, but this is this is the thing that we don't always calculate very well. And I've you might have heard me talk about this before, but you know, in after the Idrang Idrang Valley battle, we killed something like a thousand of their or two thousand of their people. And they killed 155 of ours. And our generals and political leaders looked at each other and said, yep, see, we're going to win because we can kill more of them than they can of us. And what we didn't realize at that time was they were more than willing to make the sacrifice and and we were not. And every, every casualty that we had was a travesty and a nightmare and it would hurt our soul as a nation. 
and every casualty that they had, every death that they had was moving them towards victory. So that's what I feel about Ukraine right now is Ukraine, the, the, the will of the Ukrainian people, this is where they live, this is their home, and they are not going to be subjugated by anyone else and they're gonna keep fighting uh, for as long as they possibly can. So I agree with everything you just said. Uh, when I would teach this in West Point is that the, the will to fight is, you know, this is cause what says, you know, war is a contest of will to compel your enemy to do your bidding, basically. But he also had the paradoxical trinity that it's not just the will of the people, it's the will of the government and it's the will of the military. So it's a, this is a, a triangle. So you could have all the will to resist you want, but if you don't have the military to do it or your military won't do it mm-hmm. or it, it or they're incapable or they 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 do a military coup and they they go with the other side mm-hmm. uh if your government doesn't have the will to continue like churchill like you know, he went out and pulled the people and everything mm-hmm. so it's a it's a contest of wills between these three apparatuses and even back from ancient warfare it is both a situational as in like in the country resisting but it's also in a international contest so this is your example right of course we all know um we were we won every battle, but we were strategically defeated in Vietnam because the American population lost the will to sacrifice American lives for those interests, even though they didn't believe in the domino theory and all this stuff. Each war has to be looked at through the lens of that triangle of the people, the government, and the military within themselves and the enemies. But again, going back to Sun Tzu, you're one of the greatest assets in any war is your allies. So yes, if the Americans had not joined Churchill in the fight, then it wouldn't have played out that way right so this is so yes the people can want to resist all they want they have to have some means Mm -hmm. and then that's why you know this is about what i've loved and i love my my because i learned something every day about studying military history is understanding the width of whatever it is the depth and the context in the ukraine sense the context of it is is you it has you know a coalition of democracy helping it but it's, it's not asking for anybody to fight for it. It's just asking for the means. And we can talk about, you know, in the beginning, I was kind of vocal on this. Like, we were starting with, like, we'll give you four pieces of artillery to fight a war. And that was, you know, we have given billions, and, and we could talk about what that means of, you know, if you're America first and dr- military drawdown, how we give them our stockpiles. We buy new stuff. We're making our military better. We're, you know, this is our greatest strategic competitor, according to them, and they're pennies on a dollar to reduce them. But in, in, in the beginning, we were, Ukraine had to fight for itself. And that was actually one of my visits. That's the Battle of Kiev. Like, no, nobody helped them during the Battle of Kiev. Mm-hmm. Ukrainians defeated Russians in the Battle of Kiev with some you know, stuff that I could never have thought about, even if I was on the ground. Um, it is about your, the will of your allies. So this is where, especially in the interconnected world, they were really good on information warfare. Ukrainians were mm-hmm. on projecting this. But it really mattered and you asked me about Russian brutality, it's really come into effect on how they maintain like Ukrainian moral high ground. Right? There's a moral high ground in fighting for your freedom. Mm-hmm. And it can't ever be, you know, like you lose the will of your allies and things based on the actions you're doing. So you have, yes, you have to say thank you for the four artillery pieces. I, I, I could use more, but it, it plays into this, you know, political nature. All... War is politics by other means, is the other quote. So in every context that I'm studying, even a battle, I have to understand the political context of it. And why did the president tell Ukrainians they couldn't be, they couldn't defend the city? That was crazy, right? Like, why would you say that? Because he thought it would crush the, you know, make the economy crash, like much, you know, it would in, in aggravate the Russians and then they would attack. Like there's many reasons to it. This is the uniqueness of studying as you do wars. It's, there's human decisions that aren't, necessarily rational but there there is reason mm-hmm. but there's also chance probability this is the the great prophets of the last three years that can tell you how this is going to go of course this person is going to lose they're they're bleeding white like do you know anything about war there's a lot of uncertainty i was gonna to say it. if you know anything about war it's that we don't know anything about war that's right we have a really good record of getting it wrong mm-hmm. especially predictions yeah, this one's definitely going to be hard to predict to see where this thing ends up. Right. I would, I, you know, I was studying this. You know, it's really hard to follow a war, right? So I, 
you know, following a day to day, every action on the tactical, the strategic, I get a lot of questions about predicting, but I could never have predicted that you would have a Tony Soprano type of dude who has a private military company that's an <laughs> army make a run for Moscow. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Yeah. And nobody could have predicted that. Yeah. And they try to rationalize it away. But that's an example of the uncertainty of war. You don't, we don't know what's going to happen a month from now in Russia. I mean, with their system, it isn't as firm as people believe with the oligarchs and all this stuff. And the military seems really powerful, but they're asking for Iran to give them stuff, North Korea to give them stuff. And the, the, they give people like three days of training and they emptied their entire prisons, Jocko. Like 50,000 plus Russians, murderers, rapists, like, hey, you want to go fight? And then after you're done fighting, you're free. And they dumped their entire prisons into Ukraine. And then uh, some of them actually survived, although most of them died like in the Battle of Bakhmut. Some of them survived, and all of a sudden, Russia has a lot of domestic problems because you have all mm -hmm. these freed criminals. How long did they have to fight for? Do you uh, know that detail? Yeah, it was like six months or something. I, I don't know what the, the exact guarantee to which populations was. It was like, go fight in Ukraine for like six months. But they used them as human waves, especially in Bakhmut. Mm -hmm. This is, and the black, you know, and the, the Wagner is the private military yeah, company group. group. But if, you know, all these these people that are in my world that predict like and they're gonna know what's going to happen and everything like you didn't call that one did you mm -hmm. one thing that i've said a few times is uh i expected and continue to expect to see more insurgency type activity guerrilla warfare from the ukrainians as opposed to pitched battles yeah and you did see that so that's the i've gotten that from elon right? elon musk believes that if they speak Russian, maybe they're they want to be Russian. Mm -hmm. now, you know, again, there's a history of the language that's not true. You're like, well, there'd be more, you know, you know, rebellion in the occupied territories. Like, well, there is. I mean, there's like grandmas giving Russians poisoned bread, and mm -hmm. you know, the stuff that happened in um, Kherson, uh, where the, a lot of inside was able to take it down. It's just a it's a scale issue and a means issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote the story of. For Time Magazine about the, which you you should, yeah you could probably get the guy, this Vietnam style helicopter resupply that they do into Mariupol, where you have three thousand guys that are, that are resistant and they flew seven suicidal aircraft resupplies into the the city. Uh, it's an amazing story. Yes, you, but there's a lot of history there, especially where you're talking about in the Donbass mm -hmm. because that war started. 2011 mm -hmm. um and the and the the political warfare that russia does like it did in crimea where it takes out and inserts russia friendly mm -hmm. political leaders so this is why it's also hard like one ukraine has gone on for so long that there's a lot of confirmation confirmation bias like you know drone warfare that's the future you know political warfare insurgency rebellion it's all there it's such a big war like i got that's it that's it yeah, like, so i was it right happening. i yeah. was right <laughs> it is happening yeah at you know but there is a you know each area even within ukraine this thing is huge yeah um there are different demographics different situations different resistance groups in there and you said you kept going back to ukraine until october 7th right and so how has that looked uh, from your perspective? How many times have you gone to Israel? How many times have you gone to Gaza? And what's going on over there? Yeah, so I, I one, I had been studying Israel for a long time. Where, because of... Those are some of the most significant urban battles of modern times. They were. In these various, yeah, yeah they were, I guess they were, yeah. And very unique. Yeah. Uh, there's so much uniqueness to it, but because I was doing, I was doing an international working group on, on you know, subterranean warfare. Like I was having conferences in Israel about tunnel warfare, going to Hezbollah tunnels in northern Israel that they had discovered and Hamas tunnels before this war. Uh, but yeah, they're, but they're a unique military too. So they're a military that can task organize for the environments in which they face. Where most other militaries like us, the U.S. military expeditionary anywhere in the world, is designed for a lot of scenarios. The why I kept going back to Israel is that they are they had some forces that were specifically trained for contested urban warfare, and they had stuff that we don't have, like the D nine bulldozer, which is like this three story tall bulldozer. They learned to in ur contested urban warfare when somebody has had time to prepare for defense, you have to have something that can take a hit from whatever's waiting for you. And they had this like three-story toll that I got to drive in like 2020. 
um, bulldozer with a remote control. That's like a, it's it's a armored bulldozer that's like three stories tall that rolls down the street and take a hit from anything. And they had learned in 2002 that that was very effective and, and they integrated it into combined arms. They have a tank behind it and an armor formation, but they also have one of the world's best urban warfare training sites in Saleem, better than anything we have. Um, the tunnel, so I was going there, but I also written case studies on the Battle of Suez City, um, Janine, and others, because it's, like you said, it, the genesis of like the close quarters battle comes from Israel. And some of their, I'd embedded with their Magav, the, their, their, basically their version of Delta, like the Yamam and others studying Israel. So I had a lot of connections. October 7th happened. I, of course, was watching it. Um, I've been there three times since October 7th. And I've been into Gaza each time um, because I, my unique connections and that experience that I had, that when I asked the question, like, you know, I want to understand how you're mobilizing for these, these urban challenges, I'm, I had enough connections to be able to do that. So as early as December, I was on the ground, but I was also not just studying what they were doing, which I hope we get to talk about, about dealing with the Gaza war, the war against Hamas and Gaza. But I also wanted to study the October 7th attacks. And that was the podcast I did. So I had watched the video. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you I seen have it? not seen it. Uh, I think I could probably help you um, mm -hmm. get see it. But I had seen that in November in New York City. I got in, I got in, um, so explain what the video is for people that don't know. So unique to Hamas, um, Hamas made it a very purposely wanted to record their atrocities of October 7th. So they all wore GoPros. They actually had manuals um, of how to wear the GoPro properly. And they wanted to record all their acts. So on October 7th, when over 4,000 Hamas and regular Palestinian civilians penetrated Israel's border in 20 different locations and moved forward into the civilian areas and locked them down and started massacring everybody, they recorded it all. Um, so Israel took Hamas's videos, but also combined it with like um, vehicle dash cams mm -hmm. and home CCTVs and recreated locations. And this 45 minute video is of Hamas's carnage on October 7th. Uh, and it's just a small, like it, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the sites, some of the sites. And I, I watched this in November and I've seen a lot, right? And, I, and I've now traveled the world. It messed me up. And I actually was really adamant before I saw it. Like, why won't you release this? Show the world what happened on that day. I mean, it's 90% Hamas videos. Like they captured themselves and to include beheading people and, you know, awful things that they did. After watching it, I realized, do not release this. It's, hmm. it's the way it's done. And I, like, I'm sure you have too. Like I've seen enough carnage uh, and I've seen kill TV and I've seen things, but the way they did this with having different perspectives, it almost puts you at the spot of the, whatever it is that's happening. And there's one scene that really messed me up where it was Hamas had entered one of the, the villages, all these villages are on the border and they, the dad wakes up with what's going on because they have like 30 seconds to jump in the bum because uh, Hamas on October 7th, the morning I've launched 4,000 rockets. So the entire country thought it was a normal Hamas rocket attack, although the scale was beyond anything they had seen. So they all jumped into their bomb shelters. If you live in Israel, it's a requirement when you build a house to have a bomb shelter uh, because Hamas and Hezbollah and others launched so many rockets. So in this video, the 45 minute video is one where this dad, you know, you know and I'm a, I'm a father, um, is in his underwear and he grabs his two sons and he runs out to the bomb shelter because they'd gotten the alert that the, the rockets were coming. It just happened to be seconds before the actual Hamas terrorists were in his village and they enter his courtyard, throw a grenade in there and you see him fall out of the, because they're, they're, they're not like safe rooms, they're just shelters, sometimes in the back or sometimes in the house. And you see him fall out and you see the two kids come out and they're all rippled with shrapnel and everything because the grenade went in there the terrorists take them back into the house and this house just happened to be fully equipped with CCTV camera. And the two kids are put on the couch and you can tell like they're bleeding and they're talking to each other about, I can't see where's dad, dad's dead. And then I hear one of these kids make this moan that I've heard enemy make on the battlefield. It's very like, 
deep, like eerie death moan, I call it. And the Hamas guy is standing over them laughing. And this is the scene that people have talked about where he, he laughs at them, tells them to shut up, and then goes to their fridge and drinks a Coke over the top of them. For some reason, that savagery really, at that moment, like really hit me. But it's everything. I like the, the, the glee that they, they have and when they're recording themselves, how happy they are about what they're doing was like something I had never seen. It's like they had released thousands of Jeffrey Dahmers into Israel. But that's what that video is. It's 45 minutes straight of scene at, from the Nova Music Festival to all the different villages with all these different perspectives and the, from beheadings to, you know, awful things. And who is it the Israeli government that compiled this? Yes. And it's the Israeli government that has decided not to release it. Correct. And they think their, their reason for not releasing it is because it's too brutal? Um, there's a few reasons. I've never asked... You know, I've interviewed now everybody because I've on all my trips I've interviewed the prime minister, the head of the military, like many politicians, everything. Um, nobody's ever said like, John, this is the reason we we didn't release. I know many of the reasons. One is respect for the the people that are in it. Um, it's traumatizing. It literally like causes trauma for people that watch it, and you have to like get help. Some people that that have watched it. Um, And it's the savagery of it. So it's almost like you're fulfilling the terrorist interest. Because even the Nazis tried to hide what they do. And it's really unique that they wanted this to air. And you can go you can go to like places like October7th.com and you can see a lot of the videos, just not with the Israeli kind of the dashboard cameras and in stuff. You can see most of Hamas's videos that are out there, uh, the savagery of it. So I think there's many reasons why they, they haven't. They tried to show it to as many groups as, as possible, and it, they want a control of it because you're almost fulfilling the terrorist interest of spreading it. And for the Hamas to you know, go through such extreme efforts of training their people on how to wear these cameras so they can capture all this uh, savagery, what's their purpose behind that? Why, why, why are they doing that? So it's, um, so the video, so the books that they carried, so the yeah, the videos, why they do it, because it, you know, it's, you know, some people have lost the definition of terrorism, what terrorism is meant, you know, the definition of terrorism, you know, basically violence on civilians for the purpose of political goals and instill fear in others. And, um, but I think it was a accusation of, of their radicalization. Like they wanted, they, and this is the videos of where they're literally calling back to their mothers in Gaza saying, I just killed 10 Jews, aren't you proud of me? Um, that level of radicalization within them is they wanted to spread to all other jihadists their successes. So I think that was a big part of it and part of their, their warped form of um, fundamental Islamic uh, jihadism, which isn't even what it says. So I think that's some of the, although I never asked them, that's some of the, the reasons. But it wasn't just like where the GoPro, the books actually explained, which as a, you know, as somebody who wrote a mini manual and everything, this, it was really eerie that it said stuff like, take the tires out of the Israelis' cars, light their tires on fire, and then roll them into, the, into their houses so that it, it will burn and suffocate them at the same time. For some weird reason, burning was really big to them in this, in this plan. They also had drugs um, that they took to kind of, not that they needed it to almost dehumanize the fighters if they were having problems, which was actually what happened in the Mumbai attacks as well. Um, they had food with them to stay longer. They had, um, you know, now we can get into what, what was it? Was it a terrorist attack? Which I, I personally don't think it is. I think it was an invasion. Mm-hmm. Because if you add up the 4,000 plus individuals who penetrated 20 different locations, the thousands of rockets, you get over a division of forces, and they plan to take terrain and hold terrain. They had maps to go to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. This was an invasion, and they planned for, like Hezbollah did in the north, to, for other people to join them. Um, and they had all this intelligence on all the different communities, and they locked them down. Um, from a military lens, like I couldn't have even a ranger school taught you know, many of those lessons were there. They set up ambushes on any road that led into southern Israel um, to ambush any security personnel that would come in that direction. They had intimate information on every village because you know each one of these villages are have uh, their own security 
personnel in the kibbutzes, and they have armories where the weapons are, which is a uh, you know was a evolution of the the gun policy. Mm. Um, so the terrorists would enter the village and immediately cut that off and put in snipers above that armory and take out anybody that went towards it to lock it down. The military planning of this invasion was was intense, and there's so many stories that are starting to come to light. But they wanted the rest of their jihad to see what they were doing in the savagery of it. Um, one, well, I've gone through thoughts in my brain where I, I was thinking that one of the reasons why they wanted this to be recorded and seen was because they wanted a strong reaction from Israel. And like that's why they did these things in such a heinous way. But also, you know, now that I'm, I'm thinking about it, what you just said really landed was like, this is the actualization of someone that has been told their whole life that the Jews are demonic beasts that have oppressed everyone and killed all of our family members, and they've held us down for centuries, and we must destroy them and kill them. And if you get told that your whole life, well, then when you get a GoPro and you get the opportunity to do it, you want to record it and you want to share it, which is really disturbing. Um, the psychological upbringing of these kids, tell me a little bit about the background about growing up um, under Hamas. What does that do to me mentally? What does that do to someone mentally? Yeah. Um I can't, I mean, I'm sure you could find more systematic radicalization in the world if you, you talk about like um, some other companies, but it, it would be really hard for such a intense amount of radic radicalization at birth. So by the time of Palestinian, under Hamas, right, which is this group who seized power in 2005, 2000, 2008, um, and then starts implementing this Sharia and radicalization um, and there's lots of histories to it, but it starts at birth. It literally isn't somebody who is um, a, basically has seen actions of the Israelis and then feels that resentment of their actions. There's all kinds of documentation of literally uh, basically a version of Hamas Sesame Street with characters discussing that the, how the Jews are less than human and our goal is to kill them. That's the, the ultimate form of basically um, what the religion tells you to do. So that dehumanization and interest to, to slaughter Israelis, which they, you know, it's really a part of dehumanization. It's the only way you can explain some of the, the things and the, and the rape and the mutilation and the burning and the beheading that happens on that day. That was a lot of Jeffrey Dahmer's, but that was started at birth. And then you can see um, from the textbooks that start from the first time they can read to want to not just hate the Jewish people, but to kill them and destroy the Israeli state. This is, again, going back to all these misinformed people on the American campuses that believe that this is a resistance and they just want their own state and they want uh, self-determination and better things for their They have never said those things. Their entire education, their charter, everything is about the death of the Jews around the world and Israel not existing. They even had these things called summer camps in Gaza. Summer camps were, and I thought the numbers weren't right, and I had to keep looking, like 100,000 kids a summer going through camps on how to use weapons for the sole purpose and then tactics, techniques, and procedures to slaughter Israelis and kill Israelis. And they have the sayings that you know, like almost answer, like the motto is the death of the Jews. And like that level of radicalization gets you to um, a deep hatred that isn't even like passed on from some action that happened. It's, it's programmed in to achieve your ultimate goal on life, which is crazy. Like they're, they're taught that that's their goal on life is to have children to be martyred while killing Jews to fulfill this philosophical ideal of the caliphate, which is the erasing of the Jewish people. Um, then on top of that, 
you're there in an environment where when you look outside of your house and you're a little kid and you've been told that the Jews are terrible, you look out and what do you see? Oh, you see an Israeli with a weapon in imposing control over you and your family and all of your people. So you end up with this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy because every when you look around, well, you know, my teacher just told me that the Jews are bad. And then guess what? One of your friends walks too close to the to to some security station and gets shot. Well, sure enough, the Jews are bad. And this is and it just go that goes on. You know, now this is the these are the people that live there in Gaza. And you know, cuz what 2005 2006 is when Hamas takes control there. Okay. So these are the young adults and they've been raised this way since birth. And I know you and our you and I were talking before we hit record and I brought up, you know, being a a 15 or a 13 year old in, you know, Nazi Germany in 1944, like you are just that's what you think. That's what that's the way you that's what you believe. You mentioned the Imperial Japanese, you know, looking at the emperor as if he was God. And because that's the only thing, you know, and and you know, I mentioned actually before we hit record, I had I knew a guy that was in, was raised in a cult, and he thought when he left the cult, he believed half of him believed. Well, when I leave, I'm going to get struck down by God. He believed that, and he had a little hole. He had a little uh, uh, room for error in that. He had seen the outside world, and he was like, "Oh, this doesn't. There's some things didn't match up." But here, if you're in Gaza. The things match up because you're living, you don't have food, you don't have water. You, the things match up with what you're being told and how you're living and just reinforces this idea that the Jews are bad, they're oppressing you, and the only proper way to fulfill your destiny in life is to kill as many of them as you can and martyr yourself. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, the radicalization is more than just the education but it is there, the, the the books and the religion and the sayings and everything. But you're right, it's if that's what you live in and of this population, you know, Gaza Strip is a strip of you know, of twenty five miles long, five to seven miles wide is the biggest area with two point two million people living into it, um, with massive cities, but eighty plus percent of the population lives well below global standards of property for potable water, food, everything. And they're taught that that's because of Israel. Although since Hamas seized power in 2005 and started launching rockets at Israel, that the leadership of Hamas are billionaires. Like the ones that live in Qatar, billionaires, the ones that live in, like um, those are no longer around, were millionaires. They The subjugation of the people is needed to fulfill the hatred that is indoctrinated, like you said, self prophecy validated everything they learn about. It doesn't matter if the head of Hamas gets you know saved in a surgery to rid him of his cancer. Like that, that that doesn't matter. The what they view of the outside world, and to include anybody, not them, but especially for the Jewish people, is validated in what they're living in. And the cause of that, which is unfortunately even in, in some Western societies, that this is all Israel's fault, right? The, the whole idea of apartheid, the whole idea of blockade, all of this and revisionist history, it's all Israel's fault. That All they want is to live side by side as good neighbors. Like, no, that, they've never said that. They, they, they've only ever said they want to kill all the Jews and erase Israel. It shouldn't exist. And that's what they teach and radicalize in the population. But that element of them living in poverty while they're spending billions of dollars to develop military capability to destroy Israel, that uh, there's a break in that and everything is built into it. The UNRWA refugee system, everything is meant to create this idea that they are the oppressed and the idea of just, well, I want to break away from this. I want to you know, make a good life. I don't want that everything is done to to ensure that that maintains and that cycle of hatred continues mm-hmm. and it's aimed at israel not aimed at let's say for instance egypt where egypt is right there on the border and that border is 
completely shut down and you're not allowed to be a Palestinian li- living in Gaza if you want to escape from there. You can't go to Egypt. Nope. And it used to be, most people don't understand, you know, again, with the, the history that people only want to, that they, they construct their own narrative by taking the bits of the history they want and rewarding them or whatever. But there used to be Gazans on the Egyptian side of Gaza. There was 50,000 in Rafa city actually split on the other side. And Egypt one day said, no, I don't want them there. And they basically forcibly told them to all to leave. I don't care where you go. And then since the war, which I have been as an urban warfare specialist looking at the history of anything similar, although there's very few, I've never seen a situation where the the citizen, the civilians that don't, the non-combatants, the ones that don't want to fight, have nowhere to get out of the main combat areas because Egypt closed their gate on October 7th and said not one refugee. And if anybody knows the geography of that area, the Sinai Desert in Egypt there's a massive area of land. the ability for Egypt to open the border and create a inter, you know, a temporary displaced person camp like there has been in many urban battles, tent cities, non you know, NGOs and get in there without the threat of attack uh, would have saved thousands of lives. Nobody talks about it. Nobody points the finger to Egypt because they have self-determination if they want to. And they did not one refugee coming out of Gaza and they have their history of why with the Muslim Brotherhood and their tenuous political situation right now. But I, I found it really unique that they nobody talks about Egypt. Like you in the broader scale, like the blockade. You can't have a blockade if there's another country with a border that goes in and out and, and controls the borders. It's not a blockade. And if, if there are thousands of Gazans that are coming out of Gaza, which there were, over 20,000 Gazans coming out of Gaza to work in Israel, then it's not really a blockade. And if things are getting in hundreds of trucks a day and are being searched for weapons, then it's, you know, there are lots of reasons there, but then people reconstruct this narrative. Getting back to yours, no, the, the radicalization doesn't point the finger at their situation to got to, to Egypt it only, or, or, or Hamas for that matter, obviously, or obviously. And, and Hamas is not the only bad guys there, right? So this is, you know, again, a study in war. On October 7th, Hamas and Palestinians, t- to be very clear, it's thousands. So there, was a, there were waves, and I broke this down in the article that I wrote about the attack. There were waves of, you know, Nukba, which are the Hamas special forces that came in and hang gliders, penetrated the walls, came in, went to their attack points, set up the ambushes. And then there were thousands of Palestinians who said, got the notice that the attack of the Jews was ongoing and they crossed crossed into as well. But Hamas is not the only evil terrorist group in Gaza either. They have the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Lion's Den, other names of real people who have the same radical ideal that the whole goal in life to include to be martyred is to kill Jews. So what have you seen? Um, as far as now the operations commence in Gaza and the clearance of Gaza looks like a hellscape over there. What's that been? And you've been in Gaza since October 7th. Yep. You've been on patrol yep. and seen what's going on. Yeah, I am. Um, so I went there first in December. So I watched that video in November. I went there in December. I I walked many locations, which actually was a realization. Like even watching that video, I had no clue of the scale of the October 7th attack and the military planning of it and how they locked it down, and where were the police, where were the... So I was studying it from a kind of an urban warfare terrorist attack perspective, but then I was also... I mean, this is the biggest urban-centric war, you could say since World War II, just on the scale of it, but that we've known just by, by the complexity of the urban terrain and the mission. Um, I went there in December to, to start understanding how... Israel was going to move forward to achieve its three goals. And I have, I interviewed Netanyahu, I interviewed the chief of staff, like from a, like we talk about, from a strategic goal, what are the goals, right? So after the October 7th, they had to repel the enemy. Uh, The enemy took 250 hostages, men, women, children, Holocaust survivors, American citizens back into, because there's a lot of history there on you know, the theory of you know, they wanted this counterattack. There's a lot of history there to taking hostages and 
the head of Hamas um, that's recently died, Yahya Sinwar, spent 20 years in Israeli prisons trying to figure out what Israel's greatest weaknesses were, one of them being its ally, reliance on allies in the international community, the, the deep anti-Semitism. Like, you got, he, he planned this out for years, and the taking of hostages being the same. I mean, that guy was, there was a, 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 an Israeli NCO sergeant that was kidnapped and held for five years, Gilad Shalit, and Israel exchanged a thousand prisoners to get one guy back. And during that five years, from a special forces perspective, they never knew where he was in that density of Gaza. So a thousand plus people and Yahya, the mastermind of October 7th, being one of them. So after October 7th, you had you know, 250 hostages be taken, like literally um, eight month old babies and everything. The rockets did not stop. And so I think some people discount this on like, what is the realm of the timeline of this? You had the hostages immediately being taken. Then you had 4,000 rockets launched in the first few hours of October 7th and thousands launched every day. Then on, you know, now it's down to zero or one to two or three a day, but nobody knew that they had amassed this level of a rocket arsenal, but there are 13,000 plus rockets launched out of Gaza despite the operation. So Israel declared war in accordance with UN Charter Article 51, like a self-defense war, um, with three goals, and those haven't changed since since October 8th, although Hezbollah attacked on October 8th, which does factor in. So you have this massive army attacking in the north as well. Their goals were to return the hostages, the 251, to destroy, and this is where people have tried to argue that they're not doing it, destroy Hamas. And by destroy, not from a ideal perspective, but destroy as in remove them from their military and political power. So it's more analogous when I kind of get frustrated on people thinking that Hamas is a counterinsurgency is that Gaza since 2005 when Israel left and in 2008 Hamas, there's no, that's not Israel. The Israel left it. And then in, after 2008, after the rock attacks put up the wall, it was a de facto statelet, like an area. And the goal was to remove Hamas from political power and remove their military capabilities. And then lastly is you know, prevent them, Gaza, from ever threatening Israel again, like with military capabilities. So those three goals were the start of it. Now, how did they array to do that? Is why I went in December to look at some of the bigger fights and how they started in the north. So Hamas was over 40,000 fighters, but the numbers don't really matter, because, but it was a military. So it had 24 light infantry battalions arrayed across the Gaza Strip, which includes 24 cities, 10 over 100,000. Gaza City is over 600,000. You know, Rafa is you know, 300,000. But major urban areas, all, which I think people miss, and this is where I've tried to come in with the urban warfare experience, is that a, you had 250 hostages, rockets emanating out of Gaza with an army arrayed in that territory prepared for the defense. So one of the reasons that the 2016-17 Battle of Mosul is the biggest since World War II is because ISIS had two years to prepare and prepared it in very good belted defenses. The Second Battle of Fallujah in 2004 is the greatest battle for the entire Iraq War. The entire time we're there. I know Romani was big, but the Second Battle of Fallujah. Oh, and because they were given nine months of defensive prep. Yep. So in Gaza, they had 15 years to prepare the ground and actually built the cities with the for the purpose of war. So this is and where their, and their budget was billions. Unlimited from yes. some perspectives. Yes. This is where, you know, at one point there were two hundred you know, and then I've gotten a lot of people like, why would well, if Israel knew this, why didn't they do something about it? Like the fact that there were two hundred at one point two hundred cement trucks a day going into Gaza to build hospitals, schools and everything, but there weren't a lot of high rises going up because in this 15 years, they built the largest underground network ever seen in war. They originally thought it was 300 and as they started to interact with it, know that it's over 400 miles. So bigger than the London Metro, the New York city Metro, Seoul Metro under the cities of Gaza and unique to military because China and North Korea have lots of tunnels too. They have thousands of miles. They call it the great wall underground in China but it's not built under civilians for the sole purpose of using the civilians as human sacrifice to achieve their political goal. 
because Hamas never, like you said, Hamas knew it couldn't defeat the IDF. But in its history, in Israel's history, that's not ever the goal. The goal is to attack, withstand the counterattack, and then get the world to cause them to stop. So this is where I said even in December, Hamas's only goal is to survive. If it survives the war, politically, they won. Because Israel set the goal of removing them from power, removing their military capability. But you have 24 battalions of Hamas. So you have like five brigades. And then you have 24 battalions arrayed across the, the Gaza Strip with the main part in northern Gaza with all geographic locations. Each battalion has their own arsenal of rockets and caches in the houses and its own tunnel network to support a delayed defense. I can't find in history where any military has faced those variables because you have the hostages that leads to time like just, well, let's do a siege. Although doing a siege in modern wars, um, it would be hard to do legally because you can't cut water, food and everything from civilians. Um, so you have the hostage thing, you have the, the underground network, so you can't, you, you're not going to reach that many of them. Um, the remove them from power aspects of it, you, you have to physically do it because Israel you know, went into Gaza in 2008, 2014, 2021 with very limited goals of just reducing the rocket supply that was emanating out of, out of Gaza. To do, do this, though, it's more analogous to like an invasion of Iraq Invasion of Afghanistan, invasion of Panama, you know, World War II style. I'm going to remove this, like even the invasion of Kiev. Like you got to remove the power, and then you have to take away this military capability for the next power to do it again, et cetera, et cetera. So Israel waited for. So after October 8th, Israel, of course, mobilized because it's you know it's a very small military. It only has two serving divisions, about a hundred plus thousand, kind of in the field, and it, it mobilized. 300,000 in the first couple of weeks. But it also gave notifications for northern Gaza to move below the central part. And I think you were talking about this in one of your podcasts as well, which is pretty much the standard of removing civilians from the population, right? You, you, you know what we did in the second battle of Fallujah. You, know, you drop flyers, mm -hmm. you keep notifying, drop more flyers. Uh, Israel did that in the which I found it really interesting that they did that, like because they're arrayed, um, four divisions of forces waiting to go in. They're doing, you know, basically preparatory, like they're engaging rockets that are emanating out the rocket locations. If they know where our headquarters are. They're engaging them with that bombing campaign that we could talk about. But they're they haven't launched the full full um, invasion to remove Hamas from power. So they give all the notifications, and then the, but the world says, well, you can't do that. I can't do what evacuate civilians out of combat areas so I can move them out of the, the most risk place. And they identified a, a road for them to go. Same thing that anybody's ever done. They identified a, an area to go. So they couldn't go into Egypt. So Israel identified this beach area on the Southwestern portion of Gaza. And one of the reasons they picked it is it's the only place in all of Gaza without military uh, Hamas infrastructure underneath it because it's, it's too sandy but these 400 miles of tunnels, and they only knew this, some of this now from discovering it, and I was in one in December, and it was a multi-million dollar invasion tunnel that ran from Gaza City to 100 meters outside of Israel, Gaza's border. Had, um, had power, ventilation, um, communication, ev lighting, everything. Uh, you could, now you know, you could basically enter northern Gaza in a tunnel and come out in southern Gaza. That's how many tunnels. It's like a, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I went in in February into Khan Yunus in July into central Gaza where they're creating this, where that, that, that thing that split northern Gaza. Um, nobody thought that they, that, that that was a barrier, like a natural barrier. It, a, it used to be a river, now it's a river basin that mm -hmm. splits northern and southern Gaza called the Wadi Gaza. I thought that was like a natural barrier, but Hamas actually figured out how to dig miles long tunnels underneath that river basin to connect northern Gaza to southern Gaza. So if you're a military though, and like, okay, what, what are the options here to return the hostages, get the rockets to stop firing, remove this entity from power? Um, this is what I teach in that course, um, you know, division level attack. So when I went there in December and why, I'm, why do I keep going back into Gaza is I'm trying to analyze like what are the types of forms of maneuver and operations they're doing. And I did that. 
and how they they did some very innovative things to not fight the way the enemy wanted them to fight. So Hamas had built its defensive lines in a circle with the water to their back, thinking that, okay, the direction of the enemy, Israel will come this way. So they had, to, you know, especially in northern Gaza, which was the strong point of the, the brigades, they had de- developed this defensive belt, defensive belts to include the tunnel networks that went between the buildings in a kind of a crescent circle. So Israel, of course, didn't attack, a frontal attack, you know, they're not Marines. Um, they didn't a frontal attack that. They went around it in, in like, to include commandos coming out of the seas um, and came from behind that defensive belt. Um, they also moved forward and secured the hospital, which is historical to the second battle of Fallujah. If you know that battle, we the hospital was the primary objective because it's, they're very strong information warfare aspects. But I, I found myself as I was going in there, I saw the misinformation happening about what Israel was doing, that they were being um, indiscriminate, that they were being excessive, and especially um, they were being disproportionate because proportionality and war, this is because of the social media, because of, to include everybody's ideals about Israel and anti-Semitism, um, everybody became an expert in the law of war and what proportionality was, and people thought, well, 1,200 Israelis were massacred on October 7th, so that means you can only kill 12, there can only be 1,200 deaths on the other side. Like, it has nothing to do with proportionality. So I had to, I started writing and talking a lot about even what is proportionality. But as I went in, I also, because I've, because I study urban warfare for a living, I also did a lot of work with the United Nations, um, with human rights groups that since our battles, I mean, the United Nations High Council of Human Rights said we did like 83 cases of war crimes in the second battle of Fallujah to include carpet bombing, targeting civilians, all that stuff. Like, uh, it's not new for these groups to say these things. Mm-hmm. Um, even in Ukraine, Amnesty International said that you, it was illegal for Ukrainian military to be in the cities they're defending because it puts civilians at risk. Um, so this is, I had been working, I had spoken mm-hmm. at the United Nations. There is a, a giant uh, initiative in the United Nations to ban the use of any bomb in any urban area. It's called the Explosive Weapons in Populated Areas. And like 100 countries have signed this that, if there's an urban war, we're going to not use really big bombs because it's really destructive to the cities, which sounds good in theory, mm-hmm. but as to include a lot of military theorists is that um, if you understand the Force Geneva Conventions out of World War II and all the things that we said we wouldn't do, that has now been taken by human rights groups to say there should be no war and there should be no use of explosive weapons in urban areas clearly because it destroys cities but it actually drives warfare into urban areas because it's a place where somebody who wants political power goes. So you can't touch me. Mm-hmm. And this is what, what we've seen in Hamas is the really the culmination of all my studies of, um, you know, the, the laws of war and what are protected population and protection sites, right? Hospitals, schools, um, medical staff, like all these are protected under the laws of war and Hamas built cities with that in mind. So every hospital in Gaza, Hamas used in some way for military purposes. It built these tunnels. I used to say they built their tunnels underneath all the schools and hospitals and houses. Now, after being, especially in my February, they built the tunnel and then put a school or a mosque on top of it as in this, what they call lawfare. They're, they have been studying the, our wars and Israel's you know, situation for years and they built an entire environment with the sole purpose of getting this world to do what it has, which is lose its mind on what the laws are and what the realm of possible is. There's only one battle, I don't know, you probably know this, there's only one battle in, in, in all of military history that I can find that has any of the parallels of the war in Gaza, which is really hard for people to understand. Like, um, People have tried to compare like um, Ramadi or other battles to the war in Gaza. Like, the, There are 24 cities in Gaza, Gaza City itself is over six hundred thousand people. Which which context are you comparing it to? There are five thousand in all of Ramadi. There are three thousand in Fallujah. There's only five thousand in Mosul. Are you talking about enemy fighters? Enemy fighters, yeah. yeah. And like the population of Ramadi was four hundred thousand. Right. The whole thing. And by right. time it started, it was about two hundred fifty. Yeah, 000. probably two fifty. Yeah. And yeah, like they estimate around five thousand enemy fighters. Yeah. So 
What, so do, I, what do we what do we got in Gaza? Two million. Two million people. Yep. And the fighters and are over 40,000, just of the organized, name, the named enemy. Mm-hmm. Because this is the other thing. You enter Gaza, it might not be Hamas that attacks you, but it's a, it's a combatant. And I've had to teach people, like, what is a combatant and a non combatant? Because you can be, this is a part of law where nobody understands. And maybe I didn't know as much. Like, you can, if you're a named military that I've waged war against, I can kill you wherever you are. You don't have to be holding a weapon. If there's a barracks full of enemy fighters sleeping of the other military, that's I can destroy that barracks while they're sleeping. That's the law of war. And it, you could be a civilian, and you can also, like the grandma, which is the example I try to use, that I told you about in Ukraine, who picked up the phone and called in enemy, and called in an airstrike, basically. Mm-hmm. While she was using the phone, she was a combatant. You, she could have been killed. Mm-hmm. So civilians can... Tr- and there are rules like if she stops doing it and then she's not, but if she keeps doing it every day, then she can't be killed. Um, you don't have to be carrying a weapon as a civilian to be um, partaking in the hostilities. But if you are partaking in the hostilities, you lose your protections. Um, there's only one battle that I has any of the similarities of the hostages situation, the defense of the enemy, which I think people really discount on the realm of possible. Like, again, if the enemy has had time to prepare, it's going to look different than other situations where the enemy didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, even in like the Battle of Kiev, right? There, it was, you know, there wasn't a defensive position assigned. So the 1945 Battle of Manila hmm. is the only one that I've I've found and I, and I I that has any of the similarities. So you know we were defeated in the Philippines. We we retreated, but we left thousands of. Uh, prisoners of war and c- civilians when we regained power we hit the beaches in the philippines and macarthur said go to manila and free our people because there were over three thousand american and british prisoners of war and internees so civilians being held in the city of manila the japanese originally d- had not planned to defend it but then eventually the navy the japanese generals you know, the navy admiral and the, and the guys are arguing and one of them decides that they're going to defend it they use 17,000 Japanese Navy personnel. They sink the ships in the harbor. I know there's some Navy stuff, but mm-hmm. they like try to mess up the harbor and they sink the ships and they take the naval guns off the ships and put them on land. And they, and for months they build this defensive position around Manila. MacArthur hits the beach in 1945, says go to Manila and free our people. Um, it's a city of a million. There's 17,000 defenders who have barricaded the roads they have dug tunnels that can they have sewers so they have some of the aspects of the the, the military defensive in, infrastructure um, macarthur said no air power so he didn't want the americans to destroy the city to save it so he said no air power so the thirty-seven thousand americans and some philippines attacked the city we retrieved our three thousand plus prisoners of war but it's a bloody block by block fire and a hundred thousand civilians die Mm -hmm. i've gotten into this numbers game though in my work where like that that's horrible right well just like i can tell you the the number of civilian casualties in the battle of Mosul was you know ten thousand when there were only five thousand fighters but we actually don't know how many fighters died in a hundred thousand that died in manila the japanese killed most of those the japanese were because they too didn't care about the population were slaughtering them and stacking them in the bottom of the houses. They were. They also starved them so that there would be a humanitarian crisis by the time the Americans got there. Um, but I think the unique aspect that MacArthur didn't want the city destroyed, so he didn't use the air power, which, as you know, as a military person, means that, like in my Strong Point podcast, that if you, I can teach you how to hold a building for weeks. Mm-hmm. If it has a subterranean in it, if it's ironclad made, you can hold. And we had this like in Stalingrad with the Pablo's house where I can hold a, a single building for weeks against a division level attack. Yep. So if you don't have the ability to hit the enemy once you know where he's at, it's going to cause the fight. So that's why when I spoke at the United Nations, like this is a bad idea. You're going to create really awful mm-hmm. urban wars if you say you can't use munitions if you know where the enemy is to engage the enemy target. That gets you in the category of civilian harm mitigation. So th- that's the Manila case. I can give you the Battle of Seoul, right? Hackworth, mm-hmm. Korea War. Mm-hmm. Most people know about the Incheon landing, right? You know about that. Yeah. It's like one of the greatest maneuvers of military history. Well, they hit the beaches of Incheon, and then where were they headed? Seoul. Mm-hmm. And they had to liberate Seoul. Guess who's in charge again? MacArthur. 
So that again, he says, no air power, take the city. It's called the Battle of the Barriers because the, the North Koreans set up barriers and they, they, they have a very protracted fight. Um, of, there's only 7,000 defenders. We attacked with you know, over 15,000 American forces. And there is, as I wanted to help people understand, because this, some people said, well, that's, you know, Manila's pre Geneva Commission, when we said we wouldn't carpet bomb cities, right? Because we were carpet bomb, you know, Dresden and um, trying to, to influence the will of the people and their government to, resi to stop resisting. Well, Seoul's post Second Geneva Conventions, and it was a, and MacArthur said no air power, no unobserved fires. He had to release that as Americans started dying. There is zero record of how many civilians died in that battle. Most of, lots of the city was destroyed. Um, all the Japanese, just like in Manila, I know that the, or the, the Japanese in Manila all died, all 17,000, because they killed themselves. There's no record of how many enemy died. There's no record of how many civilians died, but it's this huge, like we raised the, the UN flag over, over um, Seoul, and it was a great victory. But nobody was, and one of the reasons is because the South Koreans were killing people they thought were North Korean collaborators. There's two million that die in the Korean War, but there's actually, that's another example of a very, when an enemy takes a city, um, how hard it is to take it back, and, but where the ideal proportionality in this war, everybody started asking me, well, what's the civilian to combatant ratio? I had never heard of about, and I've been studying urban war for 10 years, I never heard that question asked. And that's where we're at now, where we have national leaders of government saying, yeah, but their civilian to combatant ratio is all wrong. They need to stop. Like, are they doing everything that they can to prevent civilian casualties? So this is the other thing that was created after our wars, actually, after the Iraq war, really at the end of the Afghanistan war, something called civilian harm mitigation steps. As you know, um, McChrystal not, um, and others started doing basically changes in ROE, and what you could do, and, and these were viewed as civilian harm mitigation steps. It became a terminology that I started to get involved with. In urban warfare, some of those are like evacuate the cities before you go, things like that. Uh, Israel did that, right, I told you, but then they started doing things that nobody does. Like Israel calls buildings before they strike them and tells anybody that's in them that, hey, we're about to strike this building. I knew that, they, they had, I didn't think they would do it in this war, they had done it in previous wars, but they were doing it in November and December, they were, it's called a roof knocking, because they'll call everybody in the building, tell them all, like, you have an hour to evacuate, we're getting ready to strike this building for its military purposes. People don't leave, then they'll drop, not, you know, basically low yield explosives on the roof and knock on the roof and do it. They were doing that, and I knew that before I went, but when I went there in February, I learned that they were doing things that no military's ever done. Um, they were using they had handed out their maps. So like our GRGs that we use, mm -hmm. Israel started, that started to be the flyers in that they were dropping were the GRGs that they could communicate to civilians to tell this, the civilians and Hamas where they would be every day and to stay away from that area. So instead of you know, saying, okay, everybody in the city needs to evacuate, they cut it up and the GRGs said, okay, today we're gonna to be operating in area 200. Please evacuate this area and stay away from this area. We've never done that. And they started also, and this is where I think I was telling you about this guy that I really want to tell you about, um, General Golfus, who's a, an Israeli Navy SEAL, Flotilla 13 guy who they made a division commander. It's just their system. Who was always trying to think ahead of the enemy. And I, I, I embedded with him and his division into Khan Yunus. And he was doing things like encircling a neighborhood because at first, Israel just said evacuate the cities, move south of the Wadi Gaza, move into Al Mawasi humanitarian zone, mm -hmm. and you know they had limited capabilities to, but they they did that evacuation. But reasonably thinking, you know that much of Hamas or hostages or something moved with them. Yeah, you know, they were mm -hmm. they were being told where to avoid. Some stayed to fight, of course, and there was um, rough battles in Khan Yunus. Um, not only did he do what's called a call out, you know what a call out is? Mm -hmm. But he did it like citywide. Mm -hmm. So um, he launched four brigades in a penetration into enemy territory overnight, surrounded a neighborhood of over 250,000, 
when they woke up, they got the notice to evacuate through these Israeli positions, and Israel used facial recognition to pick out all the Hamas that were walking out like Nukba level fighters. Mm-hmm. He's also the guy, the evolution of the tunnel warfare, why I keep going back as well, is to this tunnel problem nobody's ever faced. Nobody's ever faced you know, tunnels at this depth. So the tunnels run from underneath buildings to 200 feet underground. At, at over around 100 feet underground, there's no military munition that reasonably is going to reach that. I mean, yeah, yeah we dropped the Moab in Afghanistan in, in 2017, but that was on a tunnel complex in the cave network. There's most, even a 2,000 pound bomb is only going to get you about 30 feet underground. Mm-hmm. Um, 400 miles of these, as the Israelis move forward in northern Gaza, you know, with, they found over six, you know, at this point there are over 6,000 shafts. Uh, it's, it's, it's just unimaginable. And even when I go there, it's like I, I, I would be walking on top of tunnels that they hadn't found yet, and then they found them like an hour later, not understanding that was an enemy tunnel underneath me. But the way that they approached the tunnel, because this is about clearing ditch urban terrain. It wasn't, isn't, it's about also finding the supplies and removing it from those areas. They move everybody out of safety and they still got to clear the, the areas and they're facing the same thing that we did, right? The IEDs, the houseborne bombs, the snipers. Snipers are lethal. But the tunnels was a problem set that I just didn't, even though I studied tunnel, tunnel warfare, originally they were you know, being very deliberate about it. Like they find the shaft, secure it. They lost some soldiers even to the booby traps around the shafts. Um, but by the time they did this, the tunnel, the people in the tunnel, although they tried flooding, they actually brought in five industrial level pumps and were pumping seawater mm-hmm. and fresh water into the tunnels, thinking that it would help destroy because Egypt had had success doing that, destroying Hamas cross-border tunnels by flooding them. Mm-hmm. It didn't work. How come um, it didn't work? Because if you've ever seen, one of these are multi-million dollar complexes, and actually there's really interesting a report uh, in 2021, I was actually there when there was a, another Hamas was launching rockets and it was Operation Guardian of the Wall. So Israel was striking the tunnel complexes and collapsed a bunch. But between that 2021 and October 7th, Hamas spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to insert blast doors in the tunnels to mitigate the blast. That you know, if you, if you hit a tunnel, the blast will ripple through the tunnel. They Yaya somewhere himself authorized hundreds of thousands of dollars to put more blast doors in many of the tunnels. So this factors in when they started flooding is that they're, they're concrete tubes. So, and some of them are, are made with, um, uh, drainage in them. Wow. So they, they, in one battle in the battle of Beth Hanun, they spent two weeks, um, flood, you know, basically massive industrial level, um, pump into this, and in, in two weeks, it started to hit the surface. And actually, that's when they started to have fights on the ground. So they were having weeks-long battles with people and never barely seeing people because of the way each brigade and battalion and company have their own tunnel network. So it, it'd fill up, but then it'd just drain back out. They're, they're, not, they're not made of sandy stuff that's going to collapse in on it. And if it's, if it's not a steady, like if you laterally drill, from, there's some theory that if you laterally drill from the Mediterranean, you know, into the tunnel and had like a constant supply, maybe it'd work, but unlikely. It just would all drain out. Mm-hmm. But anyways, they were still seeding the initiative to the enemy in these tunnels. So they would get there, you know, clearing, like they'd segment, like, like we would do they, minor objectives in a certain area. Okay, you're going to isolate this. You're going to clear the enemy personnel. You're going to search it. And they found things like, things that they just didn't know were possible. I already told you about the ones going under, but they found deep buried rocket production sites. So, you know, this is the myth that all this was brought in. No, no, they were, they had the chemicals, the lays, everything to build rockets, like a military industrial base in tunnels, 100 meters underground, complete workshops, which requires advanced ventilation, everything. As they were finding this, they would always, they're always one step behind the enemy. So Hamas was doing a delayed defense. It would fight for as long as it would, move through its tunnel, activate all the booby traps and then leave they were still it was still an issue of now you had to spend all that time dealing with the tunnel and what you do about a tunnel is different than what you do about a tunnel if there's a hostage in it so that's always in this real from from the go where are the hostages as a factor in every action to include what to do about a tunnel right 
and Israel is the only military in the world just that has actually major organizations focused on tunnel warfare. Again, why I was going there, they have their version of tunnel rats. We call them weasels. It's a brigade level engineer, special forces engineer force that's trained, manned, and equipped for underground warfare. But they nobody was prepared for this scale. Mm -hmm. They quickly ran out of resources. And they were seeding the tunnels to the enemy. It was General Goldfuss in Khan Yunus when I was with him who, as an, I guess he just thinks differently. Uh, he's, he literally would do like, you know, Boyd's Oodle Loop. He would do Clause of his Trinity. I have a picture of him like drawing this stuff out. Each time I visit him, like trying to think, because the enemy was adapting as well. So he, like the casualty numbers, like the enemy deployed basically, um, fighting a war with TV reporters reporting is different than there being millions of sensors in the environment. So every action is recorded on cell phone. And Hamas did a really good job on projecting that to the world and getting them out. And this is, you know, there's a, I don't know if you saw this event, there's one example where a bomb goes off near a hospital. You know about this one? The Ali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and Hamas. Immediately said that it, the bomb hit the hospital and there was hundreds of people, and innocent it, civilians. Al Jazeera, CNN, everybody ran it. Mm -hmm. Over 500 deaths, Israel bombed the hospital. Even I was like, what? Um, and it, Israel waited about an hour just to, to make sure, like, did something happen? Like an accident? Did somebody drop something they weren't supposed to? Everything. And then come to find out it was actually the Palestinian Islamic Jihad who had had a rocket. Monster rocket and it went astray. And went astray and landed in the parking lot of the hospital and created like a grenade size hole. Um, and But Hamas, Gaza Health Ministry, it's Hamas, had formed a, before that was all revealed, had had a news conference outside the hospital with all the doctors, they emptied the morgue of all the people, laid them out and actually had people holding babies um, and did a, a national uh, broadcast of that they had just been bombed and hundreds of people were dead. Mm -hmm. uh, so Hamas was, again, doing that as Israel's trying to clear the terrain. Um, Goldfish was always thinking through that. That's why he's doing these big call outs. He's trying to outmaneuver the enemy, whatever the enemy strategy is to win. In the tunnels, he also said, like, I'm, I'm seeding the initiative. But every time they find a tunnel, it'd be booby-trapped, and it took all that time to deal with it. And the enemy was still in the environment. So he developed a way to enter the tunnels um, and not enter them to clear them, to use them as maneuver corridors. And I told him, like, sir, you, I've never seen this, where you have a force maneuvering on the surface like a brigade, mm -hmm. and then you have a force maneuvering underground. Flanking subterranean. Flanking subterranean, <laughs> or simultaneous maneuver. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, like, sometimes I ask questions, like, next question, like, how did, yeah. and I actually talked to the brigade commander who was on the surface, like, how did you communicate with him? Like, I didn't, because they, you know, they were controlling yeah. at the division level. But they were entering the tunnels before Hamas knew they were in the tunnels. And it became, and they kept advancing this to where they could, they could enter a tunnel and know from the tunnel's construction what type of tunnel it is. So whether it's a brigade tunnel mm -hmm. connecting or a command and control tunnel, and they were entering the tunnel and maneuvering on Hamas before, Ham so it, it went from being an obstacle, which most militaries view tunnels as like an obstacle to deal with, don't enter it at all costs. I think I heard you talk about just siege it. Yeah. Like why do I get go in there um, to where it's now their tunnels. It's not That's Hamas like, tunnels. I'm using them as a tool. Yeah. Uh, from the pictures, it looks like much of Gaza is devastated at this point. How much longer is this operation going to take place? Yeah, it's a great question. So at this point, as we're talking, Hamas's military is is no longer has military capability. As in, it's all of its twenty four battalions. Although there's rumor that one battalion is still effective, and by effective meaning can do their assigned military mission, right? Destroy. In our definition, kind of like our doctrine means unable to do its assigned mission. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's a percentage, like 50% destroyed or whatever. It just can't attack or defend. Uh, Hamas as a military is destroyed. Its leadership's gone, and its ability to hold ground and defend it is gone. So now it's like this shadow guerrilla force. Mm -hmm. How long, so the other people, when I wrote this in Foreign, foreign Affairs, like about Israel is, is achieving its goals. How long would it take and does Israel need to destroy all the tunnels to win? Uh, one of the challenges that Israel discovered was how to destroy a tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you talk about a two mile long tunnel. Um, they have some liquid explosives that they that they have that they mix a compound, they put it in the ground, but they they tried the the flooding didn't work. So now they have, they basically string anti tank mines along the the entire length of a tunnel and use deck cord and, and blow it uh, that way. And it, if you try to do that to all four hundred miles, there's not enough TNT in the world. Mm-hmm. But they also did, figured out that there's different types of tunnels. There's strategic tunnels that give you like maneuver all over the entire Gaza Strip or cross border tunnels. So they're prioritizing the tunnels just to find all the tunnels. And I was in July in the Netrian corridor. There's that strip that they're trying to split the two to, mm-hmm. to make the problem bigger. And, and within there, there's thousands of shafts and tunnels still left in that quarter. But your question is about the war. Mm-hmm. How long would it take to achieve Israel's ultimate goal? Because this is, this is where it could be a counterinsurgency. Although I rail against Hamas being an insurgent force. Mm-hmm. Until there is a new power, then they are the de facto power, the, even in the shadows right now. How long will it take Israel to create a security environment? Like, like you said, with, when we talk about Iraq, you had to bring it down to where the, our partners could maintain stability. Mm-hmm. And it'd be great if the partner wasn't somebody whose goal was to destroy you. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, Israel has... You know, is still searching for the the hostages. So if you took all three of his goals, how long is it going to to take? Which is a very political um, complex issue for Israel. How long will it take to get the hostages back? The, there's 101 as we're speaking still left in there. So how long would it take us? Is a different question. Right now, as we're speaking, Israel has five divisions in southern Lebanon because it had this other terror army with over 200,000 rockets attacking it daily to where it had 80 to 100,000 civilians since October 7th that had to be evacuated from northern Israel. How long, there's only two divisions in Gaza for the last like six months since the Rafah operation began. How long would it take two divisions to clear, can't hold, and to build something new? they're still doing targeted raids against Hamas remnants. So these are Hamas members that are trying to reform. Mm -hmm. They have less rockets, they have less tunnels, they have less munitions. I don't want to give a number because we were were talking about predictions. It's going to take a long time. A long time when they have five divisions trying to push Hezbollah back from its border in the north and only essentially two divisions and although they just got Senwar with one of these divisions just by a chance contact, which mm-hmm. is insane. Amazing. Um, it will take them a long time, but there is a lot of positives on like the ceiling of the border. Like I mean, this is something that we never even achieved, not in Vietnam, not in Iraq, Afghanistan, to cut off the enemy from resupply. Uh, their ability to seal that Israel, Egypt, yeah, the Egypt Gaza border, mm-hmm. which they did. And, Really, just again, you got to point the finger at Egypt. Like, there's over a hundred cross border tunnels here running a highway of munitions and everything else into Hamas since forever. And they've sealed that and they put in a new. Um, the actual interesting thing about the, the wall between Israel and Gaza is that it worked. Mm-hmm. It did, you know, the challenge before, the, it was, it's, a, it's a, you know, almost a failure of imagination was cross border tunneling underneath the wall. And they developed a, a deep sensor technology that there, is, there was none. Of course, the enemy didn't need any on October 7th mm-hmm. because it, it, they were already set. it drove bulldozers into the gate. Yeah. But it did work, so now they're going to build that along the Egypt-Gaza border, mm-hmm. a deep penetrating thing. And then maybe there's some agreements with Egypt forces on securing that. But just that step alone means less hope to the enemy. So this war only ends, Chaco, if the enemy believes they don't have a chance to win. Mm-hmm. Is there any partner force, a Palestinian group, a Palestinian tribal leader that is ready to step up, that has the wasta and the respect to say, hey, we're actually going to turn this small piece of um, Mediterranean beachfront property into an amazing place and we're going to forge a positive future? Yeah. No. No. Basically, not yet. Exist, yeah. um, this is the idea of the Palestinian Authority, which is the group of the 
Judea and Samaria, West Bank, who are also terrorists, who have this massive welfare program that pays people if they martyr themselves. It's called the Pay for Slave Program. This organization actually pays those who committed the October 7th attack and died, their families, martyr fund money. Mm -hmm. So um, there is nobody waiting at the, there's there's ideals about international, uh, like an Arab coalition of people that would come in to help provide the security force. You know, there there are ideals you could even, um, what Israel is doing is like the ink blot strategy, although it's, there's a manpower problem when they're in wars right now, seven different enemies attacking them and you have this, and there's five divisions. They only use four divisions uh, when they entered Gaza. There's five divisions and then two divisions. Th- this is these are they don't have a military. These are people in, from the economy. Yeah. Uh, there's an idea to make Gaza into smaller areas, and when then finding local leaders, mm-hmm. and there have been a few. Early, you know, during this war, who have said, "I'll be that person. I'm not. I I don't want Hamas." You know, and then this is the. What you've talked about, the, the stability operation, the post-conflict um, reconciliation, all that happens if you find another power. But right now, Hamas is killing yeah, anybody we'll kill those guys. who yeah. says. Palestinian Authority, Israel knows that they're equally as bad. And you know, that's who Hamas killed to take power was Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. So the answer is no, but... If Israel's, it's on Israel to create the security environment in which something could form. Like if you're mm-hmm. a Palestinian right now, if you know you raise your hand, you're going to get killed, then yep. there's less incentive to do it. Security for the populace. Security for the populace. So Israel is working on, um, and there are these ideals of islands, and there are even international hospitals within these islands. So there's ideas of like, okay, there's a Turkish hospital. So could Turkey come in with a, a force to create the environment in which a local leadership could lead? So it's not like they're not learning the lessons of our past, Mm -hmm. but it's like, look at the variables that they have, the alternatives they have in the moment to do what? If they don't reduce Hamas's ideal that they can win again, then nobody's going to sign up to be the the counter Hamas. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you're right, and I listened to one of your podcasts where there is now even more vocal voices within the Palestinian people or the Gazans that are resentful to Hamas for doing this to them. That is has started to grow as well. Well, that's a positive thing. That's a positive. Um, but there's, I mean, most people say, well, you have to do de radicalization. So um, I have a really good article, um, headline of, of General Eisenhower's after World War II. It's actually like an, um, it says it, Eisenhower says it will take 50 years to re educate the Nazis. And within the article, it says, if you ever think I'll give Germany the ability to wage war again, you're crazy. That's a direct mm-hmm. quote from Eisenhower. Is that people think that de radicalization, one, can be done fast, or two, can be done without there being another power. Like if you don't find another mm-hmm. power, this is the Taliban, right? The Taliban went to, went to Pakistan, waited us 20 years, came back, yep. strategic victory. Yep. <sighs> well, um, Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I'm gonna go uh, plug your podcast again, Urban Warfare Podcast. You have a bunch of really knowledgeable people that you bring on. You're obviously knowledgeable yourself, and you actually, you know, what I appreciate is you have you go there. You've been on the ground. You interact, so you know what's happening. Um, what else are you working on? What else do we need to get up to speed here? Writing a new book. So I have two new books. I have one. Um, so I've writing studying history is really really hard um and i have some mentors like general mcmaster and others so i have a case study project where i've written going back and it's been really helpful recently as i'm like you think this happened during that battle like the so i'm working through historical battles and creating case studies and they're on my the modern war institute website as well as my website of stalingrad ortona first battle of fallujah second battle of fallujah battle of Mosul with a going back and you know it takes sometimes it took us a year we wrote the 2017 battle of Marari I don't know if you know that one how long are these case studies like how many words is the completed document yeah under 5,000 words oh what, wow so we're trying to summarize because you know there's some people have attention span mm-hmm. um, so there's a 5,000 version for the website but we're building we're writing a book where mm-hmm. we're going to take 
a lot of these case studies to ones that there isn't like the battle of Mawari took us a year because there's no mm-hmm. other information out there but it was a massive battle in the philippines against isis that was very destructive i mean matter of fact destroyed 90 percent of the city of over 200,000. it was uninhabitable but it wasn't like the philippines weren't trying to yeah. protect it writing these case studies and it'll be one o- overall book and the case studies in the book will be 10,000. so the website's 5,000, but the book will be these bigger versions of it. Yeah, that's interesting because like a battle like that, like you think, oh, well, the Americans that are going into uh, Fallujah or the Americans that are going into Ramadi, they don't care really if that building gets blown up or not. They, you know, it's just, they don't care. Well, first of all, we do care, but even like when you're talking about the Philippines and the Philippine forces going in, of course, they don't want to destroy the infrastructure that they, that is part of their country. Guess what? It's freaking hard. Yep. It's really freaking hard. There's there's an aspect of that. Uh, I call it the precision paradox after somebody else called it. Uh, like in the idea that you, you should only use precision guided munitions in urban warfare is a, fa- a fallacy. It's a par- and we actually in the Battle of Mosul, there was that concept of, well, okay, you, we're only going to help the Iraqi military with precision guided munitions. We fired so many Hellfire missiles that we ran out of our strategic supply. And we still destroyed like 80% of Western Mosul because the enemy just went from one building to the mm-hmm. next. So you could precisely destroy it one building at a time. Mm-hmm. So I had the case study book and then I have this other book which is 20 times I almost died. <laughs> uh, which I've had mostly, it's mostly written. I just don't have the title locked down but mm-hmm. it's some interesting events both in military and now that I travel into war zones that I have been in some interesting chances to almost die but there's a little bit of a lesson there. Yeah, you're in a... Uh the not the safest line of work right now <laughs> it's relative right it's self safety is relative like echo might think it, it's dangerous huh? <laughs> right on. i don't i think it's very safe uh, I, don't, I, I don't lose i, I don't fear I, my enemy fears echo you got any questions yeah oh uh, well this is kind of from long time ago before the guy that you fought in the alley <laughs> Damn, <laughs> we're going back to the last podcast yeah okay. yeah all right sorry, yeah, yeah. you know i didn't get the opportunity but oh, was, was he a big was he big like was he a big guy because no. you know no. oh, okay a, so, a wiry actually a wiry feisty guy that was like to bite haymakers fight yeah, yeah. you know thumbs in my eyeballs everything yeah it wasn't yeah. a big guy yeah yeah because like if he's a big guy you'd kind of think he wouldn't be doing the biting and the thumbs and stuff yeah right you wouldn't think. His power yeah 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 because yeah. usually like like the smaller guys just busting out all their weapons yeah. We'll do that kind of stuff. Am I right? That's yeah. right, right? Yeah. The, the lesson yeah. there was I didn't need to be there that night. Like, that was just so dumb. <laughs> yeah. Feels yeah. like it. Yeah. That's a good one. Right on. Cool. Good uh, to meet you. Right and and uh, people can find you on the interwebs. You're at johnspenceronline.com. You're on Twitter, X, and Instagram at Spencer Guard. Uh, Facebook, John Spencer. YouTube, John Spencer328. And LinkedIn, John Spencer. That's where people can find you, follow you. Uh, learn from you and get updates from you um john any any final thoughts no i mean i think the so i i'm a student of this i don't i mean some people you know there's experts and who we call experts i, I learn something every day my podcast is actually my, me learning and doing research so my urban warfare project podcast you know whether it's somebody who was in a battle or you know some expert in some element of like concrete or something like that uh, i'm learning uh, so join me along the process Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for passing on some of these lessons that you have learned. Uh, Thanks for your service, your sacrifice, the Army, and thanks for what you continue to do today to capture even more knowledge and pass it on so people don't have to relearn those lessons. Appreciate it, bro. Thanks, Jocko. Thank you. Thanks, And with that, John Spencer has left the building Good to hear from somebody who has had boots on the ground and can tell you with a, a, a better assessment rather than just what you see on the news. So appreciate him coming in. A lot going on, a lot. You know, it's interesting. Um, there's things we could do in the world, right? We could yes. build, we could flourish, we could destroy. Yeah. At least on a personal level, I recommend you flourish. I recommend you build. Agreed. I recommend Jocko Fuel. <laughs> hey, check it out. Jocko Fuel, uh, we got protein, we got energy drinks, we got hydration, we've got everything that you need, joint warfare, super krill, things that are gonna make you healthy, smarter, stronger, faster, and just a better person. So go to jockofuel.com or you can go to Walmart, 
You can go to Wawa, Vitamin Shop, GNC, Military Commissaries, AFEs, De- Hannaford, Dash Stores in Maryland, Wake Fern, ShopRite, HEB down in Texas. Meyer up in the Midwest, Wegmans, Harris Teeter, Lifetime Fitness, Shields, and small gyms. We're, we're getting into a bunch of doors. If you got a jiu-jitsu gym, you got a CrossFit gym, you got a powerlifting gym, you got uh, any kind of gym, email jfsales at jockofuel.com. Also, we got, we got uh, we're in chiropractors. Chiropractors. Chiropractors are bringing us in. Um, Jared, I think, got us into some hair salons. Okay. Bra, oddly enough. Yeah, sure. So we're in there. Uh, JockoFuel.com. Check it out. Get the stuff that you need. Also, if you need jujitsu stuff, we didn't talk about jujitsu very much with John Spencer. We kind of were chatting on the way out. Jujitsu is an important part of everything. Train jujitsu. Get it yourself the best jujitsu uniform, originusa.com. Get yourself American made jeans, originusa.com. Get yourself the clothing that you wear on your body, originusa.com. Check it out. American made, no child labor, no slave labor, built by freedom, originusa.com. It's true. Also, check out the store called Jocko Store. This is where you can get your shirts, hats, hoodies, well, some shorts on there. Representing discipline equals freedom and good and other notions of similar, you know, dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, also, you just went also, down the freaking Hamas tunnel with that sentence. Also, the, also short there locker. There's no coming out. <laughs> oh, there's coming out. Uh, the short locker, if you don't know, this is a subscription scenario. You get a new shirt every month, new design every month, design a little bit more creative, you know. All of it is at jockostore.com. Also, you need steak. Check out coloradocraftbeef.com. Check out primalbeef.com and get yourself the goodness, the tasty steak, the best steak. Coloradocraftbeef.com. Coloradocraftbeef.com. Primalbeef.com. It's the best. Go get some awesome people, awesome businesses, awesome steak. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to Jocko Underground. JockoUnderground.com. Also, we got YouTube. We got Psychological Warfare. We got FlipsideCanvas.com. Dakota, Dakota Meyer making cool stuff to hang on your wall. Books. You heard some of the books today. Connected Soldiers by John Spencer. Understanding Urban Warfare by John Spencer. He's also got the one that you can download. So check that one out. Very cool. Good to have on. Good. To, good to have on tap. Case goes down. Want to be ready to defend your urban location. Also, I've written a bunch of books. You can check those out. Check out the kids' books. And again, we forgot to start. John Spencer was talking about his kids. They're warrior kids. They're getting after. He's wearing a T-shirt where his own kids' warrior coat is on the back. Mm-hmm. So, check that out. Totally legit warrior kid books. We got a movie coming out on that. You ever heard of Chris Pratt? Yeah, I heard great things. Yeah, Chris Pratt. Well, he's in it. Mm-hmm. So you might want to be checking that out when it rolls. Mikey and the Dragons. About Face by Hackworth. I referenced that a couple times in the past couple podcasts. Extreme Ownership Dichotomy Leadership. We have also have a leadership consultancy. It's called Echelon Front. We will teach you and your leaders how to unify together and win. So go to echelonfront.com if you've got a company, if you've got a business, if you've got a team and you need help with your leadership, which you probably do, then check that out. Also, we have an online training academy to learn how to lead yourself and others through life. Little things, big things. It all, everything boils down to leadership. So you need to, leadership is a skill. People sometimes forget that. It's like playing guitar. Mm-hmm. It's like the jujitsu. You just don't, you're not born ready to play guitar. Mm-hmm. Now look, some, do some of us have a natural gift and talent for the get box? Sure. Yes, some of us do. Some of us. But most people, well even me, I need a little help with the guitar. I need lessons. Sure. Somebody gotta tell me. It's the same thing with leadership. So check out extremeownership.com. You can learn lessons that will apply to every part of your life. Also, if you wanna help service members active and retired, you wanna help their families, you wanna help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got an amazing charity organization. If you wanna donate or you wanna get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. Also, Micah Fink has a great program for veterans helping them find themselves by losing themselves up in the mountains heroes and horses.org and jimmy may he is helping seals when they get out of the seal teams to find their next mission 
and transition into the civilian sector, check out beyondthebrotherhood.org. And if you want to connect with us on the interwebs, um, John Spencer, you can find him, johnspenceronline.com. He's on Twitter, X, and Instagram, at Spencer Guard. He's on Facebook, John Spencer. He's on YouTube, John Spencer 328. I forgot to ask him what 328 was. Yeah, I was wondering that mm-hmm. too. All right, my bust. LinkedIn, John Spencer. For us, I'm at Jocko.com, and we are both on social media. I'm at Jocko Willink. Echo is at Echo Charles. Just be careful because you can waste your entire life on that thing and you're going to get nothing from it. Thanks once again to John Spencer for your service and your continued service to share lessons of the battlefield so that we don't have to sit, make the same mistakes again. Also, thanks to all of our military personnel out there who fight in urban battles around the globe, a vicious place to fight. And we thank all of you for defending our way of life. And also thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, as well as all other first responders. Thanks to you for keeping us safe here at home. And everyone else out there, In uh, John Spencer's mini book for urban defense, he explains the six elements of any defense. Preparation. And, And by that means never stop preparing, even while you're fighting. Flexibility. Be ready to change. Security. Protect all your flanks. Operations in depth. That means have multiple layers. Disruption. That means break your attacker's formations. Disrupt what they're doing. Disrupt their maneuvers. Cover and move. Maneuver. We have to maneuver in urban defense. Mass and concentration. That means you need to be ready to prioritize and execute. And I would add one more thing based on his book, Connected Soldiers. Stay connected. Not just via communication. Not just radio communications, not just work communications, but foster both social and task cohesion through communication, build relationships, because a connected team is a strong team on the battlefield, in business, and in life. And that's all I've got for tonight. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. 